Okay, it's a wonderful uh, Saturday here in Cape Town, almost summer, lovely weather out. Uh, Saturday here on the University of Cape Town campus. Now, for quite some time I wanted to put together this video series just on using R for biostatistics. Now, in my research unit, R is not uh, our language of choice. Uh, we use the Wolfram language most of the time. We also use Python quite a bit. Um, but uh, uh, R is something that we use uh, from time to time. We have many students come to us and they're already working in R. Uh, many international students working R. And R is actually, it's a language for statistical analysis and it is a fantastic uh, tool for biostatistics. Don't get me wrong. I think it's probably one of the best. And uh, we do use it. Uh, uh, under these circumstances, as I mentioned. So I've always wanted to put together the, these videos uh, on the use of R for biostatistics. So this first video is actually going to be quite long. I just want to give you this whole introduction uh, to R in one quick go. Now that makes it a bit difficult because I can't tell you everything in one video and it, and it just really gets long and it is a long video. But I, I really want you to, to get an understanding of what R can do for you as far as biostatistics is concerned and uh, if you really, if you want to use it. Uh, so we're really going to run through the installation of R, uh, how to create data, how to create simulated data, how to do st descriptive statistics, how to visualize your data, and then how to analyze your data. But even before all of that, I'll just show you how to code in R. So let's get some feeling of what this functional type language is all about. So really R, fantastic language for, for uh, statistical analysis, for biostatistics, and I hope you enjoy this very long first introductory video. Now, I've already made a few others just on some visualizations, some on logistic regression, please find them. The data files that I'm going to use, they're going to be available on GitHub, so you can just download them. I'm going to tell you all about our pubs, where you can publish your documents as HTML documents. Really all a fantastic, powerful tool, R and R Studio. So I really want you to enjoy this. Let me know in the comments if you see anything that you want more videos about. Um, we use R, uh, as I mentioned. Um, you can do anything in R as far as bite statistics are concerned. So really, if you are interested, just let me know in the comments and I'll make more videos. And especially for all the international uh, uh, medical personnel that do visit us. Uh, in our unit and uh, who want to use R, no problem whatsoever. So really the first, first thing that I want to talk to you about is just the installation of R. Now we mentioned R is a programming language specifically based uh, on doing statistical analysis. And the way to get R if you on Windows or Mac OS is just to go open your favorite browser and just type in R spaced CRAN and we see CRAN is the Comprehensive R Archive Network. So if you just type that in, the first link that you're going to see probably is cran.rproject.org. And if you go there, this is what you're going to see, a very austere, old-fashioned kind of website. But everything is there for you to download. And you can see there Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And if you click on those, you, you're going to get a file. You're going to download it and install it as you would any other program. Now, you can install or get at least the files to install R for Linux here, but if you're on a Linux system, I would really just suggest that you use uh, the uh, package software that comes with your distribution. There is going to be a type of app store for your distribution, and R would usually be there. It's usually called R-Base or R-Core, all the distributions. Uh, Give it a bit of a different name, but if you search for that, you are bound to find it. And it's much easier to install it through your distribution than it is from downloading a package and installing here, unless you know uh, what you're doing and you are familiar with installations on Linux. So once you've installed that, that is just going to give you a, a user interface um, that really just allows for typing at a terminal. And what we really want is a graphical user interface. So after installing R, I want you to search for R Studio, and you can say R Studio, R uh, Space Studio. First one that's going to come up probably is rstudio.com. Let's have a look at that. And it's in a development environment that will see where your installation of R is on your system, and it'll use that, but in a nice graphical user interface, and I'm going to show that to you shortly. Here you can learn a lot about R Studio, though. There are even paid versions here. We're not interested in that. We're just going to download R Studio there. That's the free version, and you're going to install that. Uh, you can read about some of the packages that the R Studio uh, company, if I can call them that, do develop. Uh, you see R Markdown, Shiny, Tidier, Knitter, ggplot2. They're all going to be there available for you free of charge, but you can look at those packages. 
And really the way that R works, there is this base language itself. And that is what you downloaded from Cran. But it is extendable. In other words, people can come and write extensions to the language that just makes your life so much easier. Uh, Shiny, for instance, is something that you can use to develop programs. Tidier, very nice to wrangle your data. If you bring data in, you can really clean it up nicely. ggplot2, they are a very fantastic plotting library. Now I'm going to show you, you can plot just with base R. You can create very nice plots and graphs, but ggplot2 can give you even nicer looking graphs. And there are really thousands of these packages. Very easy to install, very easy to then just use in R, but they just make the, you know, the abilities that R has to help you with your statistical analysis is just so much bigger with these thousands of applications or packages that you just then add to R. Another beautiful thing of uh, R is this R Pubs website from R Studio, rpubs.com. And if you are here on R Pubs and you refresh your, your web browser every now and again, you'll just see new files coming up, coming up, coming up. If you're in R Studio and you create a file, which I'm going to show you, you can upload it to this cloud website and everyone can see it. So it's very nice if you want to collaborate with people. People can see your work. You can collaborate with others. And you can also just look at other people's work here. And it's a brilliant place to learn a few things. So for instance, a lot of the work done in my unit, we do put out here on our pubs. And this video is all going to be about introducing R for biostatistics. And the file is already being created and it lives right here on our pubs. So if you go to this Jean H. Klopper, that is rpubs.com forward slash J-U-A-N-H-K-L-O-P-P-E-R and then slash intro to R for biostats, all those words with underscores between them. But just go to Jean H. Klopper and you'll see all our files there. And this is the file that we are going to create. Let me hide the toolbar, give us a bit more space. And this is what a document looks like that we created in R. It was very nicely formatted here. You see that we have a title here, a subtitle. We see a table of contents and we can even click on those. That is going to take us down to this. We put a nice logo in there. And another subtitle section here with nice text written in. And a whole document that I created for you. And this is what we're going to run through. I'm going to do some, talk to you about the libraries, some simple arithmetic how to create lists, what computer variables or objects are, how addressing works. We're going to talk about distributions, descriptive statistics, visualizing our data, tables, which are just data frames that uh, you can see that as very fancy spreadsheets and we can import spreadsheets as tables, how to import our data, how to inspect the data, how to select out of your data only the things that you want, descriptive statistics on this new data of ours, visualizing this new data and a bit of inferential statistics. So I'm going to show you all of these. You can just look at this document here, but I'm also going to show you how to create this document. And uh, it's, uh, this video is really for you to decide, uh, will R solve your problems? Would it be a good tool for you to use? So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I mean, this is going to be a long video, but I just want to give you a, a nice introduction to, for you to decide, do you want uh, to get into R? So you can come and have a look at this file, but this file is also going to be available on GitHub. And here we are on my GitHub site. So that's Jean Klopper, that's without the H. And then we have forward slash R underscore statistics. So all the files that I've created so far live on this GitHub repository and you can just clone or download it. If you don't know how cloning works in Git, you can just download the zip file and it's always going to give you all of these files. And if we look down here, we can see intro, quick intro to biostatistics.rmd. That's the actual file. And if you download that, you can open it in R Studio and you can see the actual file. Now that you've installed R and R Studio, you open R Studio. This is not what you're going to see because this is the file uh, that you've just seen in R pubs. What you'll see is a blank slate. And what you can do is just go to file new script or just under file you see the little plus sign there R script. Now that is certainly one way to enter data into R. I can type in 2 plus 2 and if I hold down control or command and hit enter 
you'll see the console opens up at the bottom and you see there 2 plus 2 and you see the solution 4. You also see this little 1 inside of square brackets next to it and we'll come to that a little bit later. So this is one way to work with R. You can also work right down here in the console. I can type 2 plus 2 down here and instead of hitting control and enter or command and, and return, I'm just going to hit enter and we see the 4 appears right there. The difference between this console and this window up here is this console is not going to save anything for me. I can do some quick calculations there, but it's not going to save anything. This file up here, I can save that file and I can reopen it and everything I typed would be back there. So these are the two main parts, but let's explore a little bit more. On the right hand side, quite a few other things. We see an environment here. And if we store, start storing things in our file, those are going to appear here. A history of what we've done before. Connections we're not really going to be too concerned about in this introduction. The importation of data sets, we're going to do that right in the code. We won't use that. Very importantly, the right tiny little right bottom here. Files is just going to show you the file structure of where you are at the moment. Plots. If you were to make any plots in your code here, it's going to appear in this little section down here. And you can even export your plots as different types of images, JPEG and PNG, etc. Packages, very, very important. This is where we're going to go when we want to install packages. Remember I said thousands of packages exist and they extend the base R to allow us to do a lot more. And we're going to click on install and then here type in the name of the package we want to install. Leave everything else as it is and just click install. And those packages will then be installed on your system and you can just import them. And I'm going to show you how to do that every time you uh, have a new file, you can just import all the packages that you have installed. Help? Absolutely fantastic. A whole set of documentation, and I'm sure if you had to print all of this out, it would be a very thick textbook indeed. So all the documentation there for you. And viewer is going to give us a view of uh, certain things, and we might get to that uh, right at the end, we'll see. So. Definitely, this is where you can go. You can also then just click on the save button there and save this file. That is not what I want to talk to you about though in this introductory session. I want to talk to you about R Markdown. So if I click on the little plus sign and we go down, the third option there is R Markdown. It's going to say the following. Do you want this to be a document? Do you want it to be a presentation? And that is like PowerPoint. Shiny, remember I said that's an application, or there's even some templates that you can choose from. So we're going to stick to document. And you can give your document a name, let's call it test. You can put in your name there. And then you can say the default output format, you want that to be a web page, and that you can either export to your own website or upload to our pubs. Do you want the export to be a PDF or do you want it to be a Word document? So lo and behold, you can write all your code and you can export it as a Word document or as HTML. Now you can change this after the fact, after choosing this. So just leave it at HTML, no problem there whatsoever. And this is going to open up this default new file here, which you can then go and save as well. So if I were to click on save, it's going to open my folder structure on my hard drive and I can decide where to save it. The first bit of code that you'll see at the top is these three little minus signs and it ends on line six with another three little minus signs. And this part is called YAML, just another markup language. And that just tells RStudio what to do when you do export it eventually to a Word document, to a PDF document, or to a HTML document. It, it just gives us that bit of information. And I'm gonna show you how to change that a bit later. Now here you see the three tick marks, tick, 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 and then curly braces, and then R, and then a space, and then setup, and then a comma, and then include equals false, and then knitter, K-N-I-T-R, and two colons, options, chunk, dollar, set, echo equals true, close the three little tick marks. And that is called a code chunk. So if we go back to just this normal just this normal file that we did to the R script. Everything you write here is code. But 
if you do an R markdown, you've got to put your code inside of a chunk like this. Everything outside of a chunk is going to be viewed as normal text as you would have on a web page or a Word document or PDF. So you've got to embed your code inside of a chunk and I'll show you how easy it is just to create a new chunk. And when we go to the right hand side here, you can click on this little wheel and it's going to give you a bunch of options for this chunk and I'm going to show you all about that as well. What we see below here though is now just normal text. This is outside of a chunk and you see these two little hashtags here or pound signs or symbols and because we are exporting this to HTML as it stands, that tells a website how big this text should be. Or if we export it to PDF or Word, how large also this text is going to be. And these little marks here, these little hashtag or pound signs, you get from one of them all the way up to six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. Six being the tiniest little sub, 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 subtitle and just one being the largest, that's a title. Uh, but you see title up there, that's just going to put test in this biggest form it can possibly be. Now I can change it here, even though we put in test, doesn't matter, I can change it here to something else. Something else that is by default going to be H1 or just the one hashtag. And two hashtags means slightly smaller, that's H2. Now, or header two, a second size header. And then you just get the normal text. You can put in hyperlinks by just putting them inside of these less than and greater than signs. You see more co-chunks there. I'm going to show you all about these. So we can mix this text. We can mix different sizes of titles and subtitles and we can create this research document. So just imagine this, you produce a document of statistical analysis, but in between you can also just write normal text as you would any normal text editor like Microsoft Word. You can even do spell checking by hitting F7 on your keyboard or going up to edit and all the way down the F7 you can see check spelling. So we can check your spelling. Really phenomenal uh, piece of software RStudio. Um, it is basically a web browser in the back, back end, the part that spots that you don't see, but the parts that we do see here, the graphical user interface, fantastic to work with. So again, as I said, imagine you can put together this research document that you can share with others. You can export it as HTML and share that, put that on your website. Uh, you can share it on our pubs or just print it out as a PDF or Word document, share that with your collaborators. And it's got mixed code and the results of that code. So your statistical analysis, your plots, your graphs, and just normal words in between. So it's a beautiful research document. So let's just go to the document that we created. So the, what I do is when a new document like this is opened up, I would change a bit of this and I'll show you now. And I'll come right from here, right to the end, select all of that and delete it. That's how I like to start. That was just a bit of template that RStudio opens for you just to show you around. But this is where I like to start. I know that I'm going to have a nice big header there. That's from the title in my YAML. And I'm always, always going to start with a subtitle. So that's two uh, little hashtags or pound signs. And now I can start typing. Because if we look at the document that we're going to work on, it looks slightly different. I've added a few things and I'm going to show you all about those. But this is where it really started with these two hashtags. And I have introduction there and we start writing the introduction. But I'm going to show you all about all these changes that I made just so that you're familiar with them and you can incorporate them in your own documents. So let me show you how I like to set up my documents. So here's our title. So I just changed it to a quick introduction to R for biostatistics. The author is this there, but then I change this output. So if we looked at the output before, it just said output HTML and it had the date there. So I took the date out and then I put output colon and then on a new line HTML document and then TOC colon space two. That is going to give us a table of contents and the number sections I want false. If you put that to true, it is just going to give you one, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, then two, 2.1 as your subtitles, sub subtitles, etc. go down. And that's, that's not what I want for my document, but you can certainly put that to true. 
So this would be a default for me. Now the first thing I did here is just for the sake of this introduction, is just I created a code chunk. Now the way that you can create a code chunk is just to go up here to code and say insert chunk, but you can see the keyboard shortcut there on a Windows and Linux machine that's going to be Control Alt I, and on a Mac OS that is going to be Command Option I. So let's do that. I can just come in here. There we go. Let's hit enter or return. Create a bit of space there for ourselves. Again, there we go. I'm going to hold down Control Alt or Command Option and hit I. And you see there we have a code chunk. So I can start writing my code inside of this chunk now. And that would be completely analogous to the way that we just entered code here in a normal script file. And we can run this file and that would execute for us line by line. We see line one, number one there is going to have two plus two. That's going to execute and give us a four. And then line two and line three, etc. But here in an R markdown file, we have to put it inside of this chunk. Now, if I go to the little gear icon here, immediately you see I can give this chunk a name. And let's give this chunk a name and let's just say, just call it name. As I type name there in the tiny little block, you see name appeared there. So the first thing after this R in a space is going to be the name of this chunk. And it's very good to give your chunks names because when you give this file to someone else or you look at it weeks and months down the line, you can remember what that code chunk was all about. Now you can also decide on the output. Now whatever you do here is going to be reflected by some code that is generated on the side. And after a while you get to learn what this code is all about and you can just type it in there and not come to this little gear icon. But you have a few options here for output. You can say show output only. That means when we do create our Word document, our PDF document or an HTML document at the end, the actual code is not going to appear only the output of the code. So you can imagine a situation where all you want to show is just some words and text and headings and subheadings and you want your graphs to appear. Not the code that generated the graph and the plot. You would choose that. Show code and output. And that is going to show the code that we write and the output. Show nothing but run the code. Sometimes we have to execute some code, get some results which are then used later. And we just want to run those, but we don't want those to appear in the document. You can choose that. And then show nothing and don't run the code. Don't uh, know really why you would use that, but there probably are scenarios which you can. Now you can also choose not to show warnings and not to show any messages. Sometimes when we import packages, they're going to overwrite some of the base functions that are inside of R, or they're going to overwrite each other's functions if we import more than one package and it'll give you some warnings and some messages and those can just be a bit of an, a bit annoying especially if you know that they're going to appear and you know that it is going to happen and you work through that it's not a problem for you you can just untick those and nothing will happen use paged tables we never use a my unit and use custom figure size you can certainly look at that if you want to but you notice when i untick those we had comma there and then message equals false and warning equals false. As I said, after a while, you can just start typing those yourself. If I hit apply, we can start writing here. Now what we've seen see down here is exactly what we are busy creating here. I called this one comments and I said include equals false. I don't want this included in the document that is actually going to be produced in the end. Now here's some actual code, but you can see the beginning of this code has a hashtag or pound symbol. That has nothing to do with the heading and the size of the heading because this is inside of code. Inside of code, inside of a code chunk, it means something completely different. It is actually a warning to R itself that this is just a comment line. Everything uh, to the right of this on that line is just human comment and R will totally ignore it. So if we go back to just a normal script, I can do the same here and say this is a line of comment and that's it and it's going to be completely ignored when the execution goes line by line that's completely ignored and again it's a very good way of just leaving some information for your future self or for your collaborators that if, if you want to let you yourself know or someone else know what this was all about 
So do make liberal use of naming your code chunks and putting these lines of comment in. Now, why name these code chunks? Another good reason is if you go right here, right to the bottom, and you click on that, your whole document actually opens up. And because I've named every chunk, you can see that chunk 52 has mean age by group. So it's very easy for us to go find something later on that we were working on. Instead of scrolling down this long file, we can just quickly go look for that. And you see here in darker text, it's tiny here on the screen. I hope you can see it is all the headings and subheadings will also appear here nicely tabbed out so that you can see how this document was put together. And if I remember that I quickly wanted to go to addressing again, I can just click on it and it'll jump to that section. But this only works really if you name your chunks and it will automatically see these symbols here that uh, for your headings, it'll automatically see those, but name your chunks Otherwise, it's just going to say chunk six, chunk seven, chunk eight, and you're not going to know what it's all about. So just get into that habit. Uh, I prefer to do that. Now, just in this last little bit on setting up this document, two more things. And that is, if we are going to produce an HTML file, we can actually bring in some cascading style sheets. And I can write normal HTML uh, just by putting things inside of these less than and greater than symbols. So I'm just going to put a bit of a style in. And so my opening style HTML tag there, and then my closing style tag there, and then anything in between is what we actually want. So the type is text forward slash CSS, cascading style sheets. That's just uh, normal. We just put that in. And then all I want to do is heading one, heading two, and heading three. So that's akin to the single hashtag in markup language the two hashtags and the three hashtags. So that's the very big text, the, the title text, the subtitle and sub subtitle, it just gets smaller. And I've just given them each a color. The color is an argument there or, and that goes inside of the set of curly braces, colon then, and then in hexadecimal code, starting with a hashtag, the value. So that's a navy blue, that's a gold, and that's a slightly lighter uh, sort of navy blue. So that gives us a color and you can bring in all sorts of other things. If you know HTML and you know cascading style sheets, you can really uh, go to town on your web, web pages and, and really change it up and, and make it look all fancy. Last thing for this uh, section before we start with the actual introduction is you can also bring in some logos. Now, one thing I want to say about that is that we are going to save this file somewhere on our hard drive or on our solid state drive. We're gonna save it somewhere. And what I like to do is all the files that I work with together with this notebook, this RMD file, this markup file, I store in the same folder on my hard drive. Everything lives in that same folder. And that means I don't have to go type in the long address bar, C colon backslash, my documents, backslash, et cetera, et cetera. And on macOS, it's going to be different. I keep it all in the same folder. And then I do the following. Now remember this R setup includes files that was automatically inserted, this knitter options, chunk, set, echo equals true. That was there automatically. What I like to add there is this little line of code. Set WD, get WD. Once I've saved this file on my hard drive, I can let R find out where on the hard drive this actual file is by this text here. Get WD open close parentheses. Get working directory open close parentheses. That is actual R code. It tells R go find out where I am at the moment. So you have to fa fa uh, save the file first. And then you can run this get wd and it's going to return this long string of c colon backslash or mac os is a bit different so it knows where it is and i use that inside of another function so you don't know a lot about functions at the moment so just roll with it so i've got set to wd and it's got its own set of open and closing you can see the open close parentheses there and this get wd with its open close parentheses lives inside of the set wds open and close parentheses now these things are called functions and what goes inside of these parentheses are called arguments. So this get WD 
without an argument, this is open close parentheses, that is an argument inside of the set wd function. So I'm passing this argument to the set wd and that just means that long address that get wd got for me, it's passing that as an argument to set wd. That tells this file we are using this little part of our hard drive where this notebook is saved, uh, or I should say this R markdown file is saved as the default. So anything that lives inside of that same folder, I can just reference directly because this file knows where it lives now. And now I've got this nice little PNG here. We see it there, it's called KRG Elegant Logo for Light BG dot PNG. It's a PNG image file. And I don't have to put the long address to get to that C colon backslash images, what, wherever on the, your C drive or whatever drive it is. Because we've used the set WD, this file knows where it is in, in the world. And because this file and this PNG lives in the same folder, I can just type the name, name of the file. And if I had a spreadsheet file, I would also save it in that specific folder. That is the way I like to work. It just makes life so much simpler. And the way that you get a logo into your, into your Word document in the end or HTML document in the end is by this exclamation mark, open and close square brackets. And then in a set of parentheses, you just type the name of your, of your image file .jpg or .png, whatever it is. And now when we export this, that actual logo that you saw before, that will be there as well. So that's it for the, you know, how to, how to set up the way that I like to set up my files and my research unit and uh, uh, it just, it's a structure that we use and this will be the default and you can actually just save this as a template and just open that template every time. Next up we're just going to start then looking at libraries. So let's talk about these libraries. Now all I'm going to do is just a console here at the bottom. I'm just going to click this little minimize button. You see minimize and maximize. I hit minimize, it goes away. I can hit maximize again, it'll come up. So let's just talk about libraries. I mentioned before it is just these packages that allow for the extension of base R so that you can do so much more. The ones that we're going to talk about is what we're going to use here are these five, Tibble, Reader, Dplyr, DT, four of them. And they're not going to be there by default on your system. So please go to packages and then install and then you can type them in one by one, Tibble, Reader, Dplyr and DT. And just install them one by one. That's the safest uh, to do and they'll be available. They are on your system now, but every time you run a file, you've got to actually just tell R to go use them. And the function for that is this library. Every function is followed by a set of parentheses. And inside of those parentheses, we put one or two or three or more arguments. We separate those arguments by commas, but each of, each of these just ha will have one argument. That's tibble, reader, dplyr, and dt. And you just type their names as it appears there. Now to run a code cell, we've got to actually run these. So if I run this first one here, nothing is going to happen whatsoever. I just want to delete this one. So I don't save it in my system. Let's just neaten things up. Single open line there. You can just click on this little run button and that will run the code. You see a little green line appear there. And let's just run this one. There's nothing in there. It's just comments and nothing is going to happen. This one actually has something in there. So let's run this code. So the knitter options have been set and the set working directory, get working directory has been set up. So I can just click, as I said, on this little run button. Alternatively, I can hold down shift, control, enter or shift, command, return. And if we do that, if we just inside of the cell, that is going to execute as well. So that's just the shortcut, keyboard shortcut, shift, control, enter, shift, uh, command return and all of those libraries are now part of R and I can just use all the functions that are inside of those libraries. So let's start with simple simple arithmetic and so I've got a bit of text there simple arithmetic I've written a few lines of text what I actually would love for you to do is to go on github and download this file for yourself and start making your own notes. So go in between these sections, make a little space for yourself and just type in your own code, my own notes, and just start doing that throughout this. I've kept the notes very sparse in this document because I'm just talking about all of these things. 
but I would love for you just to download this document and just type in your own notes in between. So addition we've seen before, very simple, 2 plus 2 plus 4. I'm going to hold down Shift, Control, Enter, Shift, Command, Return, and we see execution there. It's 8. And again, this mysterious little 1, and we're going to talk about that. Subtraction, it's just like a normal calculator, very easy. Multiplication, remember we use, we don't have a multiplication sign on a keyboard, so it's Shift 8, that little star symbol on most keyboards. Let's execute that. We see the answer is 24. Let's do a bit of division. 3 divided by 4 is 0.75. Powers, we use the little carrot symbol, Shift and 6 on my keyboard. 3 to the power 3 is 27. Now we can also mess about with the order of arithmetical operations. Remember, we do division and multiplication before we do addition and subtraction. So if we want the addition to happen before the multiplication, we actually have to put that in parentheses. So this says do the 2 plus 4 first and then multiply by 3. So that's 6 divided by, uh, multiplied by 3, that's 18. Otherwise, if I didn't put those, it would be 4 times 3, which is 12 first, times 2, uh, plus 2 is 14. But we're going to get the 18 here because we forced that. Just some other functions, something that we might use a lot in statistics, just the exponent, Euler's number. e to the power 1 actually gives me e. And e, Euler's number, we write in R as exp, exponent. And if we raise that to the power of 1, we're actually going to get Euler's number, 2.718282. Uh, so we see there 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 decimal places. Log base 10 is log 10 is the function, log 10. And I pass an argument to it. In this instance, it's 1,000. So I'm saying, what is the log of 1,000? And the log is base 10 here. And 10 to the power, what gives me 1,000? Well, 10 to the power 3. So log base 10 of 1,000 is... 3. Now the normal log function without the 10 there, that function, will give me by default Euler's number e as the, as, the, uh, as the base. So this is actually the natural logarithm. But I can actually specify the base. So I could say here base equals 10 as my second argument. So let me, let me do this properly and show you. If I start typing log and then 1000, the base is going to be e, it's natural log, but I said I can also say base equals 10. So what we have here are two arguments for the log function. 1000, the first argument, it expects the number for which it wants to calculate the log of, and then comma, a second argument. This argument is called a keyword argument because we're actually specifying a name for this argument. We didn't give this first argument a name. I didn't say number equals 1000. That would be wrong. The way that this code was written is the first argument that it expects is, is the number that I want to calculate the log of. So I can just write it. But then thereafter there are some keyword arguments. And keyword arguments you can put in different order. You can put one in front of the other. It doesn't matter because they have names to them. The first one that it does expect though, and that's the way the code was written. You can't do anything about that, was the actual number. And so that's not a keyword. And sometimes there are two or three or four of these which are just expected in that order. You can't swap that order around. But once you get to the keyword arguments, you can swap their order around because they've got names and R won't get confused to what you're trying to do. So one of the keyword arguments for the log function is the base. And we say base equals, and yeah, I said exponent 1. So that is just E. So that is just the default. But what I like to do after a comma is hit enter or return because I like to put my arguments, most of the time, I, like, I love to put them one under, one uh, following the other on its own separate line. And you can see the nice little indent that RStudio does for you all by itself, and that's fantastic. And we see log, the natural log of a thousand is 6.91. Next up, we're going to talk about lists. So let's talk about lists. We've put in single numbers, we've done some arithmetic, but what if we want to save a bunch of numbers or something else? And we call those lists. And we create these lists uh, inside of R. We sometimes refer to these as vectors, but just let's call them lists. We put them inside of a function called C, just C for concatenate basically. So I'm going to say C, and then I'm going to pass the list of arguments. And the arguments are just going to be values. So let's imagine these are 
systolic blood pressures of patients. So a patient had 120, the next one 120, the next one 110, the next one 130, the next one 140. So those were the one, two, three, four, five systolic blood pressures. And I'm just typed them all in and I put them inside of, as arguments inside of this C function. Let's run that. And we get back the 120, 120, 110, 130, 140. As simple as that. Now we need to just stick numbers in there. Here we, you can see that I sticked actual words in there. Or I can even put sentences. These are called strings. And strings go inside of quotation marks. Always, always, always put words inside of your code in quotation marks. They're called strings. So here I have pneumonia, ARDS and bronchitis. And I can run that and lo and behold I get back my pneumonia, ARDS, chronic bronchitis. Still with this mysterious little one at the end. Uh, in the beginning I should say. And we're going to get to that. Now you can think to yourself, well, it is a bit unfortunate. Do I have to type in these numbers over and over and over again if I want to reuse them? Well, fortunately no. What we can do is create a little space in our computer's memory and we can store this in that space. Now this little space in memory needs a couple of things. And that's the way computers work. First of all, it needs to have a name. I have to give that little space in memory a name and that's called a computer variable name. So what we've done here is given it a name, SBP. And please give it a descriptive name. Again, you give your code to someone else, you look at your code, months or years down the line, you sort of want to give it a name that means something to you that you can just look at and say, oh yeah, that's what I wanted. That's that's what I was referring to. So SPP for systolic blood pressure, that works for me. So I'm going to call this SPB. And then we're going, that's the little name, the computer variable for that little piece of memory. And then we're going to store something inside of that piece of memory. And that thing is called an object. And that object has a type. So if we see here C with 120, 120, that is a list. So we are putting a list object inside of your computer memory and we give that little bit of memory a name, a computer variable name called SPP. In basic, basic terms, this is what is happening. Now you'll see this little weird thing, less than and minus. Now you are very welcome to use equal. Now, equal in a computer language means something very different to equal in mathematics. The equal symbol, a single equal symbol means assign. It says, take whatever's to the right of me and assign it to whatever's to the left of me. So here we have a list object of integers and we are saying assign this to whatever's on the left and on the left it recognizes this characters that you typed and it knows that this should be R knows that this should be a computer variable name. So it's an assignment operator, this equal sign. It's not an equal sign, it's an assignment operator. So we're going to store that inside of SBP. Now how do you choose your names? As I said, please choose them that it means something to you. Don't start it with illegal characters such as spaces or numbers. Never put a space inside because it's going to be seen as two separate things that you're trying to enter. Just stick to the basics. SPP works for me. Now, it's stored in my computer memory, this list object, and I can just recall it by just typing its name. So I'm typing in the computer variable name in this code chunk, and I can execute that, and it's now going to give me back those numbers. 120, 120, 110, 130, 140. So I don't have to retype them ever again. They are now stored in this piece of memory in my computer under this computer variable name. This object is stored there. So let's create one instead of typing it in. Uh, something very useful uh, that I use every now and again is this sequence function, SEQ. That just reminds me, I forgot about this little equal sign that I said that you could use here. So you can use this equal sign, but it's more common in, in R for a variety of reasons to use this little assignment, little symbol. And to very easily get that is to hold down Alt or Option and hit minus. That's the keyboard shortcut, Alt minus. And it sort of shows what it's doing. It's, it's, the arrow is pointing to the left here. It's a little stabby arrow. And it is clearly trying to show that take whatever's on the right and pass it to what's on the left. It's, it's, a, it's a better idea of, a visual idea of what this assignment operator is. So I like using it instead of the equal sign. 
as arguments though, keyword arguments with the name of the argument and then its value, there we put the equal sign. So we have here, this SEQ stands for sequence function. And it's taking here three keyword arguments, from, to, by. From says start at one, to says where to end at 100, and by is how, by how many jumps. So one, jump two is three, jump two is five, jump two is seven, and that's what the sequence does for me. I don't have to put the by, if I don't put the by in, the default is one, so it'll always go up in one, then it'll be one, two, three, four, five until 100, but I want to go up in steps of two, so I put the by keyword argument in there. Again, I'm assigning it to this computable variable, and now you see a different uh, naming convention here. I can actually string words together, remember I said no spaces, and I can use dots, uh, this is called snake case, because you can snake the words together. Uh, another, the proper snake case is actually just making these underscores. That really is snake case. So I could, could have called this the patient numbers and just put these underscores in between, no spaces. But I like the dots when I work with R, it just sets my mind that I'm working with R. If I work in Python, I use underscores. If I work in Julia, I would use underscores. If I work in the Wolfram language, I will just not use any spaces or dots or underscores, every subsequent word will just be an uppercase letter. So this is what I would normally do inside of Wolfram language. Patient, the first one always lower, lower case, and then every subsequent word so that I can read it as a human being goes into uppercase. So it's just the way you can use, all of these work in all these languages, but I just like to use these different things and it just reminds me in what language uh, I, I'm working in at the moment. So for R, I like these dots in between. And then I'm just going to call that computer variable and we're going to see what it looks like. There we go. One, three, five, seven, as promised. Now we can see something else. Remember the mysterious one? Now we see a 25 and a 49. And that is beaut a beautiful segue into the next section and that is addressing. Because I have a list object here, Every object actually has an address, just like you live at a certain address. Every element inside of a list has an address. And it starts at 1. R starts counting at 1, whereas Python starts counting at 0. So just remember, R starts counting at 1. So that's element number 1. That's element, the 3 is element number 2. This 5 is element number 3. And 4, 5, 6, 7. And what R does when it, when it shows you the calculation, it just says the first one on this line, and you might have a much bigger monitor, you might have a much smaller monitor as far as the resolution is concerned, so you might see more on that page, on that line, and you might see less of the elements on that line. Uh, it just says this first one on this line, what element number is it? So this 49 is element 25, and this 97 is element number 49. So it's just a small little indication of, please remember that all of these have an address, addresses go in square brackets and I'm just telling you that the first element in each of these lines I'm just giving you their addresses. It's just a default setup. So let's have a look at addressing. So let's talk about addressing and remember I said that always goes inside of square brackets. So if I were to call my SBP and I would just put the number one inside of square brackets behind it, it says give me back element number one. And the first element that we had in there was just the 120. And we see the one next to it, that was 120. But what if I wanted the first three ones? Well, I just use this colon symbol, one colon three. It says one, two, three, one, two, and three, a little range operator. And that gives me the first three back. If I only wanted number one and number three, I'd have to pass that as a list. And remember how to create a list? Yes, they are arguments to the C function. So C, 1, 3, will give me back then inside of this set of square brackets, which means addressing, I'm going to get back just the 110, uh, 120 and the 110. That was element number 1 and element number 3. So in short, that is addressing. Addressing gets a lot more complex. So let's move on to distributions. And what I really want to do here is to show you how to generate your own data. Now, when I use a new computer language, when I learn a new computer language, I just want to play around and I don't necessarily have or want an actual data set. 
that I might have lying around. When we have data sets on patients, we keep those very secure. Uh, we are diligent about that and we, we don't use it to play around with. So we generate simulated data and that is what we use as a teaching tool. So I want to show you how to generate your own data. When you learn a new language, when you just want to practice, just generate your own data. The beauty of generating your own simulated data is that you have absolute control over it so that you know when you do the analysis on it what to expect. And it also, when languages upgrade, so in some of the other languages that we have, for instance, Julia, in which you can take a course on Coursera and get a certificate from the University of Cape Town. Uh, Julia changes, it's a new language, and it's just gone over to version 1.0, so many things change. And when they do change, I just want to test things out, so I would generate a new simulated data set that I can play with. So let's generate some data, and we're going to do that using different distributions. So first of all, let's just look at the uniform distribution. Remember, that is when I have a numerical data set, and, or a categorical data set, and every value in that sample space, every data point value in the sample space of that variable has an equal likelihood or probability of being chosen. So the first thing I want to show you here inside of this code chunk is this set.seed function. And I've passed giving it a, an integer argument. You can just use 1 or 1, 2 or 1, 4, 5 or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it doesn't matter. If you use this same number every time. It means if you rerun this code, the same random numbers will be generated for you. So if you were to run this code, you're going to get exactly the same. If you used one, two, three, like I have here, you're going to get the same pseudo random numbers. So I'm going to create this computer variable called age, and then I'm going to use assign to that this list object. And to create this list object, I'm going to use the sample function. The first argument is not a keyword argument. It just says, give me the range of values that I can select from, the sample space for this variable. And it's 18 colon 85. That's a range value. So it says from 18 to 85, I didn't put a step by. Remember like the sequence, we had start and stop and end. Uh, start and, and, and um, from, end and by, from, to and by, I should say, as keyword arguments. And then the by was two we used. By is 1 as default, and I can also write it in this way, 18 colon 85, so that's 18, 19, 20 to 85, that's the sample space. Comma, the set next argument that it expects is the number of values that you want, and I want 500 values, please. And now I say replace equals true, and true inside of R is all, true and false is always all capitals. You can also be a bit lazy and just type uppercase T for true and uppercase F for false, but I like to type it out, true and false. And <clears throat> it says that if you choose a number, say 27, and it then throws that 27 back into the bowl so that when you choose at random next time, that 27 is available again. If you didn't say replace is true, that 27 was not available for a second choice, and that might be, you might want to do that. And here we're just going to say that equals false. So let's run that. We now have an age variable that's got 500 values in it. Now look at my environment here on the right hand side. We haven't spoken about that. Remember when we created SBP and patient number? They are all there. They live here so that we can take a quick peek at them. And there we see age, which, we, which we've just done. It says there in the address, there's 1 to 500. So there's 500 values. And look at this. It says int. It means all of the values in there are integers. So it looked at my list object and it looked at the specific elements and it saw, well, they were all integers in there. Great stuff. Let's create the next one and I'm going to call it before.after. So just imagine you had a, a study and you measured patients' cholesterol before and after giving them a new drug and you just want to know what the, what the difference was in their cholesterol before and after this intervention. So that would be one way. Uh, so we're going to simulate that according to the normal distribution, and more than that, the standard normal distribution. And for that, I'm going to use the R norm function, and I'm going to pass a single argument, and that's just 500, meaning I want 500 values. If I don't put any other arguments, it's going to use the standard normal distribution, mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and it's going to give me back 500 values at random from that distribution. <coughs> Now, what if I don't want the standard normal distribution? I want a different mean and a different standard deviation. So here I'm going to create an SBP. Now, we've used SBP before. Now, if I reuse SBP, I'm going to overwrite that little piece in memory with new values. So it's overwritten. 
Again, I'm using set seed one, two, three, just so that when you run the code, you're not going to get a surprise. You're going to get the exact same values as me. Now, look at something I've done here. I've put this R norm with its set of, you see if I hover over the first bit, it highlights the closing parentheses. So there it is. Let's just look at that. R norm. Now I'm going to use three arguments. The first one is how many there are, 500. But then there are two keyword arguments, mean equals 120, SD for, equals 20. Now SD is standard deviation. So I say, give me a normal distribution with a mean of 120, a standard deviation of 120 for mean, standard deviation of 20, give me 500 values back from that distribution. But that's going to give me six decimal values. And I don't want six decimal values. I just want no decimal values. So one way to go about that is to pass all of this, this R norm, this complete thing, as the first argument inside of the round function. So the round function takes the values as first argument, and then it takes a keyword argument digits equal, and then that means decimal places. So in this instance, I want no decimal places. So it's going to give me these 500 values of blood pressures, and when we measure blood pressure, it's integer values, there's no decimal values. So when I simulate that, I like to keep it real. And so I put that inside of the round function. Here we create one called CRP, say for instance for C-reactive protein. Again, I'm putting that inside of the round function. This time I want one decimal place. And the first argument is this actual 500 values that I want. And this time I want it from a chi-square distribution. <coughs> so R C H I S Q. 500 values again, second keyword argument, so keyword argument df equals 2, so 2 degrees of freedom. So let's generate that. And there we go. Now I want to do something else. I'm going to have as my sample space some nominal categorical variables. Very easy. I'm going to set my seed, I'm saying calling this one group, sample, and instead of a range, say 1825, I actually pass a list of actual strings and my two strings so that goes inside of c the c function i'm going to call it con, uh, control and placebo i want 500 random of those and replaces two i have to put replaces two otherwise i'm just going to get two back once control is taken and i don't throw it back into the bowl for being selected again at random it's not going to be there and only placebo is left so i'm only going to get the two and the four, 498 is not possible, the other 498. So I say replace equals true. So I'm going to get back. And if we look up here, once I've executed that, we see group appears there and it's control, placebo, and it's going to carry on 500 times. And both control and placebo have an equal likelihood of being chosen at every instance. Now, instead of each of them having a 50-50 chance of being chosen, I can actually set the weights. So in this one, I'm going to call side effects. So side.effects, sample again. My sample space is a list of no and yes. I want 500 values, replaces true. But this time I want a probability of being selected. So I'm saying in this same order. So I've got to have two values because my sample space has two values and it's in that same order. So no will have an 80% chance of being chosen and yes, we'll only have a 20% chance of being chosen at every iteration of this 500 drawings of samples. So very important there. So we're going to have a very skewed distribution here. So there's going to be many more no's than there are yeses. And we can do that. So we've simulated our own data. Let's let me show you on the simulated data how easy it is just to do descriptive statistics. And that's up next. So there we go, the descriptive statistics. Now there's a lot of just inbuilt functions built into base R. They've got nothing to do with these extra packages. And here they are. Mean is very easy. It's just the mean. The, the keyword is just the, the function, at least, is this mean. And I'm just going to pass my list object, which was called age. And that contained the 500 values there. So let's just run that. Remember, that came from a uniform distribution. So every value was equally likely to be chosen. And we see a mean of 51.184. Median, well, functions is called median. And the median was 50. The variance is VAR. And standard deviation you've seen before, that's just SD. And you just pass the name for that. Remember, the variance being the square of the standard deviation. Range, when we do range, it's going to give us back the minimum and the maximum value. 
And in those 500, it did indeed choose 18 and it did indeed choose 85, which was the limits of our range anyway. But in this instance, it was. It doesn't, doesn't mean it would have to be there. This is at random. But in that using that set seed at 123, uh, if you run this, you are going to get the 18 and 85. Interquartile range, very easy, IQR all uppercase and that's going to give me the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile and that is 33. Speaking of those quartiles I can get those values back as well and one of the functions that you use I like to use quantile then I pass my list as first argument comma my second argument for the quantile function is what the quartile is I actually want so the first quartile is equal to the 25th percentile so it's 0.25 and I get back that value the 25th percentile value and then the third quartile is the 75th percentile so I use the 0.75 as second argument and I get it there and if you subtract those two you get the interquartile range which is 33 and indeed 33 plus 34 is 67 so that works. Now there's a summary function and that is just going to give me uh, all of these all in one go let me show you summary age and look at that I get the minimum the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile, and the maximum all in one go. That's fantastic. If I write a report or we write a journal article for submission, beautiful. We can just do the summary statistics in one go. I love the summary function. Now when we talk about categorical variables, imagine that's a large data set. Someone collected it for us. Uh, it's thousands of rows long. We don't know what all the, all the unique values are, this, what the sample space of that single categorical variable might be. Now, we simulated this one. We know exactly what we put inside of group. But if you didn't know and you just want to see what that sample space is, just use the unique function. And that shows us there's only two elements as in the sample space of this group variable, and that's control and placebo. But that's the way we designed it. So no problem there. So summary statistics on the simulated data, very easy. And I always say when you are doing uh, healthcare research, medical research, biostatistical research, any kind of research, do descriptive statistics first. You get all this data on a flat sheet, a flat file usually, that's a spreadsheet file, uh, even if it's then extracted from a database file. Uh, when you look at the large set of columns and rows of data, you don't know what that data is trying to say, what the message is, what the knowledge is that's locked in there. You have to tease it out. And as human beings, the best way to do it is first to summarize it, and we summarize that through descriptive statistics. And then secondly, I love to visualize it, because that visualization is going to give me a great idea of what the statistical analysis is going to show. So describing it first, and then visualizing it. So let's get to visualizing the data. So here, you, here we go. As I said, I left lots of space here. Please make your own notes in between. Make this document your own. So the first one I want to show you is just a normal box and whisker plot. So once again, R has got lovely built-in visualization, but you can use the ggplot. I love to use Plotly. Uh, there are some videos out already on using Plotly and R, these libraries that or packages that allow you just to create uh, even better looking plots. But right here inside of R, Plots are fantastic by default. So box plot is the function for a box and whisker plot. And let's just look at the age. I'm going to hit that and there we go, a beautiful plot. We see our median there, the edges here, first and third quartile, and the minimum and maximum as far as these are concerned. There seems to be no statistical outliers there. And you can see the values here on the left hand side. And they are written on their sides, and I'll show you how to fix that. I don't like them on their sides, but let's just roll with it for the moment. Now let's just start being a bit more, say for instance, this is going to go on our website, or this is going to be a presentation. Let's just bring some life to this plot. It looks nice to me, I love it. But let's add something to it by some keyword arguments. So I'm going to say box plot, and then age is my list of values. And then comma, my first keyword argument is going to be COL, that stands for color. And the colors, all the colors, there are specific names and there are a lot of them. So the first one we're going to do is deep sky blue, always inside of quotation mask, marks. These are strings. Main is my uh, second keyword argument, my third argument in this instance. And that means the title. So I'm going to call it patient age. Remember, that's a, a set of words, so that's strings. So we put them inside of quotation marks. X lab means the X axis label. And I want that to say patients. And the Y lab is the Y label. Uh, 
I had the y-axis label and I want that to say age. So let's run that and see what it says. Very nice indeed. I see this deep sky blue color. I see my title there and I see my x-axis and y-axis titles there. Labels, I should say. Beautiful. That's, that's quite pretty. Now, just a, a word on this. You see this is happening inside of the document itself, not here inside of the plots. When you do all of this inside of just here, we could have done all that code and instead of putting each of the sets of codes inside of a chunk, here we can just write the code. Uh, but if we wanted to leave ourselves uh, titles, you can't do that here. If you want to leave yourself little comments, you have to put it in a comment line like we do here. You can't just write normal words in here. So I like to work in here, rather put my code inside of code, in, inside of chunks, and then write in between the stuff that I want. But if you did that here, the plots, the plot will appear here on the right bottom side. But here in the R, R in D file, the R markdown file, it is going to appear right in line. So let's look at histograms. Hist is our function of choice. H-I-S-T, it's going to do a histogram. Let's take the before dot after. Now remember, we chose those 500 values at random from the standard normal distribution, so we better see a Gauss sort of curve here. Let's make the color pink. Main is difference in measurement before and after treatment. My x-axis label, my y-axis label. Very easy to do. Let's hold thumbs and look at that beautiful standard normal distribution. Isn't it fantastic, this histogram? I just love it. And we see our labels there, and we see our title, and we see the color. What about a scatter plot? Now remember, scatter plot is we're going to have an independent variable on the x-axis, a dependent variable on the y-axis. So each patient will have this, these pair of values, and we want to have a look at them. The keyword, uh, the function for that is just plot. And we're going to plot the age against the systolic blood pressure. The first one is the x-axis value, independent variable. Second one is the y-axis value, the dependent variable. So remember, you have to have an equal length of those the same number, so if we had 500 and 500, those pairs, you have to have a value for each side of the pair. We're going to color this just in blue, we're going to have a title and we're going to have some labels, and there we go, we see a fantastic, nice scatter plot, and we can really see there's no dependence here between age and systolic blood pressure, so I know when I do linear regression or correlation, that's going to be very poor. Age is not a predictor of systolic blood pressure in the simulated data that we created here. So, we've created all our simulator data. Uh, I don't like to keep it in this format. I like to put it inside of what is called a data frame. And especially when I have a spreadsheet file with actual real patient data, we bring that into R, we can import that. We're going to import that as a data frame. So whether it's my simulator data, I'll convert that to a data frame. And when I import my spreadsheet file with actual patient data, that's going to be imported as a, as a, uh, a data frame as well. Now, data frame is, one, is, is built into, into R, but I don't like to use a data frame. I actually like to use one of the newer packages, uh, or new ideas that gives us a tibble. And it's a weird word, but it just means a fancier data frame. So let's just look, have a look at tibbles. So let's create a tibble from the simulated data that we've had. So I'm going to call my tibble my.data, that's my computer variable name, and I'm going to assign it to this tibble. Remember that's a package that we, a library that we imported. So tibble is the function, and what it does is you have got to think of this of a spreadsheet file. I'm just trusting that you've seen a spreadsheet file before in your life. The first row is just going to have all the column names in it. And those column names usually for us refer to the variables. So there's going to be age, or patient number, systolic blood pressure, etc. Those are the column headers. And then down that column, we'll have all the blood pressures, for instance, of all the patients. But if I look down a single row, that'll be the blood pressure, age, whatever, for that single patient. So have this spreadsheet idea in your head. So what we're going to do here is give the column header or the variable a name. So age, I'm going to write uppercase A, age and I'm going to assign to that my 500 age list object. And then I'm going to have difference as my second column header, my second variable. And I'm going to assign to that the before dot after 500 list object. Uppercase CRP, I'm going to assign CRP and see how why I created those names that meant something to me and now I'm just using it in a different way that still means something to me. 
So we see group equals group there, SBP, and now I put S small and BP large, uh, whatever you want to do, and side effects I wrote in all in the uppercase, but I'm assigning those list objects with the 500 values in each to a name that's going to be on the top first row, the column header row of my spreadsheet. But remember, there's not a spreadsheet, this is a tibble. Let's do that. And now we see my data appear on the right hand side in our environment here. And to the right here, we see a little, little spreadsheet icon. And if I click on that, a new tab is going to open up. Very tiny here. You won't see it if, you, if you're viewing this uh, not at a maximum 1080p. But there you see, it looks like a spreadsheet. There's my age, the difference, CRP, group, SPP. Remember, that's why it set the names. And there's all the 500 values under age, all the 500 values under difference, all the 500 values under CRP. But every row is one patient, for instance. So this patient was 37. Their cholesterol came down because the after was less than the before. There's their CRP value. They fell in the control group, though. And they had that blood pressure when they got into the study and they didn't develop any side effects, for instance. So let's just close that table, but you can always get to that table just by clicking on that little icon there. If you are down here, you could see the console opened up. And what it was actually is the view function with an uppercase V and then my dot data. You can also come and type it in here. Let's do that. And that's going to open the same thing for us here at the top under a tab. So that's the same as that little symbol there. Let's just minimize our console here so we can carry on. So that is our tibble. Now I might want to share this as a spreadsheet file with someone else. I want to export this as a spreadsheet file. And inside of tibble, there's this function called write underscore CSV. Now, please do the following for me as a proper researcher. Never save your spreadsheet files as Excel or any kind of proprietary file format, XLSX. Save it as exported as CSV, comma separated values files. That is a much better way for us to share files with each other. So I'm going to use this CSV file. Now, when you open a CSV file inside of Microsoft Excel, for instance, it's going to look like a normal spreadsheet. One thing that it doesn't have, it won't have all the fancy formatting and it won't have different uh, tabs at the bottom of your of your spreadsheet file that you can have different spreadsheets inside of the same file. There's just one spreadsheet per file. But anyway, that is the proper way to do it. So I'm going to, first argument is going to be my.data. That is our actual tibble that we've just created. And then I'm going to give it a name, data.csv. Where are my hard drive is it going to go? Well, remember we said set wd and then we passed this argument get wd. It's going to put that in the same folder as this RMD file. I set it up that way. If you want to put it in some specific way, remember that you can say C colon backslash. You actually have to put two backslashes. We, know, we won't talk about that. I hate doing that. It just all lives in the same folder. For that matter, let's talk about importing a file. So with tibble, we also get read underscore CSV. Now, uh, just in normal, normal base R, that would be read.csv. That's a different function that's going to import it as a data frame. I don't like data frames. I like the more modern tibble. So I use the tibble library and I use read underscore CSV. And I'm just referring straight to this project, the data.csv file. If you downloaded it this from, from my GitHub repository, that project data file is going to be there for you. And we're going to use that for the rest of this tutorial and it lives inside of the same folder so once again using my set wd and its argument get wd it's all in the same folder so i can just bring it in i don't have to type the address to this file in there so i'm going to execute this and there we go i've now imported a spreadsheet file so here we exported a spreadsheet file here we are importing a spreadsheet file and if you actually go look at your folder structure, this data.csv file is actually now going to appear with the simulated data and we can give it to each other. Now remember we imported the DT, the DT library. That is a very specific library if you're going to export something to the web as an HTML file. It just formats your data very nicely. And, and I like to do that when I do export to HTML. It has a function called data table. And I'm going to pass data. Remember, that's this spreadsheet file that we just imported as a tibble. 
I'm going to do that and it's going to do this very nice formatting when I export. It actually has a little search bar and you can go to the different pages until you get to the end. Remember there were there's 500 I think in here. Yeah, there we go. See there, that's the data that we imported. It has seven variables and 500 each values for each. So that's slightly different from the simulated one. This is one that I had simulated before and saved before. But it's a very nice way you can search and you can also just do ascending to descending order there. So very nice. Now that we've imported this the actual data set, there we go. Now that we've imported this actual data set, let's just have a quick look at the DPLYR dplyr package. It is a bit difficult. I'm going to warn you right now. What it allows us is to extract only certain values that we are interested in from our data. And that's a very powerful thing. But it's not the easiest thing to get used to. And you're going to have to watch some tutorials specifically on this. Yeah, I just want to introduce you to this concept uh, of extracting data using the dplyr library. So the first thing we want to do here is just to create a new table. Because remember we used read underscore CSV that imported it as a table. So we want to create a new table, but we don't want everything from that. We only want to select certain things. And what we want to select is only patients in group number one. Now let's just have a quick look at this spreadsheet file that we imported. Just to show you, it has an age column. It has a difference column as well. It has a CRP column. It has a group column. And inside of this group column, we see that we have only ones and twos, ones and twos. So patients were either assigned to group one or to group two. And what I want to do is only extract the patients that were in group one. So how would I go about that? Well, first of all, I've got to give this new table a name, a computer variable name, and I'm going to call mine control.group because imagine the group one patients were in a control group. So now you see something very funny going on here. I don't I want you to ignore that. Let's just go to this line 325 because this would be one way to write it. Now you see it's as a comment, and if I uncomment it and we comment this one, so that line won't be executed, the second line will be executed. So let's start with this one. I'm going to use the filter function and it just says filter row by row. That's what this thing does. And the first argument is, well, what tibble are you referring to? Well, I'm referring to the data tibble. And then the second argument, let's just put that on its own line. It says filter group equals equals one. Now you see the two equals sign. That's called a Boolean operator. It asks a question. Is that line, that row, does it equal, does it contain a 1? And that will return either a true or a false. If it's true, it will be included. If it's false, it will be excluded. Now, this is not the normal way in which we write it. We use that little symbol there. Let me comment out this. Let me bring this, uh, comment this line out as well. We've got to comment out line by line. So let's do this. That is the proper way that we do it. We use this symbol. It's shift control m shift command m it's the pipe operator we create a pipeline of something that we want to execute and what the pipe does this whole little thing it says what take whatever is to the left of me and pass it as first argument to whatever is to the right of me and that's just what we had down here it was data comma data comma so it just says Take this data and pass it as the first argument. And it doesn't make much sense now, but as you start using it, you'll see actually see it makes a lot of sense, especially if you start stringing together a lot of these pipes. So at the moment, it just says, take my data tibble, go down the group column and find only the ones. So if we run that, we're going to create a new tibble. There it is up there. And if we were to look at that, we'd notice that it's just ones down the group. There's going to be no twos there whatsoever. Whatsoever. Here's another one that I did. Younger patients. So I said younger dot patients. Go to the data table and pipe that to the filter function. And what I'm looking for is the age column, everyone younger than 50. 
So that's going to extract everyone that's 49 and below into a new tibble. We see the tibble there, and when you open that, you'll see everyone is younger than 50. Now, <clears throat> this one is slightly more complex. I'm asking here, I want the patients younger than 50, and they must be in group number one. So again, computer variable name, younger.patients.2, <laughs> whatever. So the data table, and I'm going to pass that onto the filter function, and I want two things. And what we do with two things is we put this little ampersand in bes uh, between them. So strictly speaking, and let me do that right now, I've got to have another set of parentheses there. So it says age less than 50 and group equals 1. So I want both of those in, in this filter function. Now it's only going to have that patients younger than 50 and only in group 1. And I've created a new table called younger.patients.roman numeral 2. And as I say, you have to look into DeepLire itself. Leave some comments down below if you want videos just on DeepLire. But it's a very powerful thing. This is just a very brief introduction to it. Very powerful indeed to tease your data apart and only get the values that you're interested in. Now next up we're going to look at some more descriptive statistics, this time not on the simulated data that we created one by one, just list object by list object. This time now we're going to extract some of this data using DeepLayer from our table and we're going to do descriptive statistics on that. So let's have a look at that. Okay, let's go about describing this table of ours. So the first question we might want to answer is, can we get the mean age of the patients that belong to group 1 and the mean age of patients who belong to group 2. Now we extracted, we can extract those as two different tibbles first, but we can just use the main tibble and do that. Let's see how to go about that. I'm going to call my tibble, that's data, and then I'm going to pipe it to the first function, which is the group underscore by. Group by, that makes sense. And the column which I want the group by to happen is by the group column. And we remember there's patients in group 1, the control, and 2, the treatment arm, whatever the situation might have been. And then I pipe that, once I've grouped them, I pipe that. And you see why I said that these pipes, once we start stringing them together, they actually make a lot of sense. So I'm going to pipe that to the summarize column, uh, summarize function, I should say. And then in the summarize, I want to create, ask for the mean of the age column. And what we do here is we just give that mean just a little column name. So I'm just going to say mean.age. That's a name I decided on. And you're going to see why we give that little descriptive name just in a moment. So once again, take the data table, group by whatever you find in the sample space of the group column, and then summarize that for me by calculating the mean of the age column. So let's run this and see what it does. So there we go, we get a tibble back, and it'll have group here, and it found group 1 and group 2, and then it's going to give me back the two mean ages of those two groups, and see mean.age there, see we just had to give that column a name, and that's where this little name comes from. So, very easily done. So in the next one, let's just see uh, if we group by the side effects. Now, some people had side effects, some people didn't have side effects. I want to know how many had side effects and how many did not have side effects. So I just want to count the number of those unique sample space elements. So start with a tibble. We're going to group by the side effects. And we pipe that to the summarize function again. And this time we are going to use this n function. In open close parentheses, nothing else, and we're going to call that count. What this n is going to do, it's going to count the, the, the unique values. So if we run that, we see count there, that's what we created, and it just does the count for me with this n function. 289 no's, 211 yeses. So you can see when I created this data frame, or this uh, spreadsheet file, and simulated data before I gave a bit more weight to the no, not the 8020 that we did. Uh, in the beginning, this was a slightly more equal. So let's do this. Let's. What I want to know now, how many people in group 1 had side effects and no side effects, and then in 2, how many had side effects and no side effects? Easy peasy. I'm going to say data. I'm going to pipe that to the group by function, and 
according to the group, and I'm going to pipe all of that, not to the summarize. Now I can do summarize, but count actually will do the count for me, so I don't have to say summarize count equals n. Uh, I can just do this all in one go, much easier. I'm just going to say count and then pass side effects as an argument to count. So that's just an easier way to go about it. And now we can see group 1, group 1, group 2, group 2. So group 1 knows was 137. Group 1 yeses, 114. Group 2 knows and group 2 yeses. And that is what you need for a contingency table, your observed table for a chi-square test for independence. Easy to extract that information from our table. We have the values there. We can do a chi-square test. As easy as that. So when you have a table, when you've either created your simulated data or you've imported it from a spreadsheet file, it's easy. You can see at least the potential for how easy it is to draw this data out, the values that you want, and, and just describe them. I do mention though that using dplyr in the beginning as part of what is called the tidyverse is a bit difficult in the beginning, but you'll soon find out that there's a few functions that you can use in dplyr. You string them together as a pipeline, and in, in the end it just makes so much sense, it becomes intuitive to use. After you've described your data, what do you do? You visualize it. So let's have a look at visualizing the data. Now these packages work very well together. Uh, the tibble and just the normal plotting inside of R. Let me show you. So we're going to do a box plot and I want to do the age. So I want a normal box plot of the age. Remember before we just did the age, but this time I want for the different groups, the different sam the sample space elements and groups. So remember they were type uh, group one and group two patients. And that we just by, do by creating a little formula and we do that formula by this little tilde sign. It says, I want a box plot of the age, but please separate it by the group. But now I've got to tell it what the tibble is that it's got to work from. And it'll work for old fashioned data frames as well. So I'm going to say data equals data. That's my keyword argument data. And that's my tibble name data. It doesn't matter that they have the same name. R can figure that out for itself. Color. Now I know there was group one and group two. I know there were two. So I can pass two different colors and it's going to be in that order. And I'm going to do deep sky blue and orange. I'm going to have a table name, a title. I'm going to call that H distribution by group an x-axis label, a y-axis label, and this time I'm going to use this new keyword argument LAS, and I'm going to set it to 1. And I want you to guess what it's going to do. <laughs> That's a bit unfair. Let me show you. There we go. Beautiful. Deep sky blue and orange. Group 1 and 2. Age here. But look at this text on the y-axis. It's all standing up right now. And that's what the LAS equals 1 does for us. It just shifts those, let the, those numbers so they just look proper. But even, isn't that just the most, one of the most beautiful graphs you've ever seen? I, I absolutely love it. I do like Plotly a bit more, but there's some videos you can watch that I've made on Plotly. Let's make a scatter plot. Remember for scatter plot, the function is just plot. And this time we want SBP, systolic blood pressure by age. Now, which one goes where? Which one is the dependent variable that's on the y-axis? Which one is the independent variable that goes on the x-axis? There's a little clue for you. The x-axis is the age and the systolic blood pressure is y. So it's always y-axis then x-axis. So it's saying I'm trying to predict this dependent variable by this independent variable. So it's always y tilde x in that order. Everything else being the same, LAS is 1. And once again, we see that we don't have this age is not really a predictor of systolic, systolic blood pressure there. But with the stibble, very easy to do that. Let's do some inferential statistics. I'm going to show you the most common statistical test. We're going to start with students t-test. So there's my two pound signs hashtag. So that's going to be subtitle h2 size. And then a sub subtitle with the three hashtags. So that's going to be slightly smaller. And then you see I write students and then underscore t underscore underscore before and after a word or, or a set of words or even a paragraph, that means italics. I want that T to be in italics when it's printed out. And if I put two of them on each side, that means bold. If I put two in front and two behind, it's going to be bold. One in front, one behind, that's italics because I want the T to be italicized. So let's do student's T-test. 
very simple to do when you have a tibble. t.test is my function name. I'm going to pass some arguments to it. Here's a list of all the arguments at their default value, so you can actually leave them out. Remember, keyword arguments have default values, so if you don't put them in, those values are used behind the scenes. But let's look at them so you can see that you can set them. I'm going to say, I want you to compare students t-test, remember, that is um, a variable between two groups, same variable, in two groups, compare the means to each other. So it says, compare for me the systolic blood pressure between whatever you find in the groups. Remember, students t-test, you can only have two groups, and we know group, group only had group one and two, so this is going to work for us. The tibble, well, that's the data tibble. Alternative, what is your alternative hypothesis? Is it two-sided, two-tailed hypothesis, or is it one-tailed? We want two-sided, and we pass that two-dot-sided argument. Mu is the mean. We expect the mean, our null hypothesis that we create, we, we want to say there is no difference between the two, so we say mu equals not, uh, zero. Paired equals false. We can also do a paired, a paired sample t-test. And then we, do, we just say paired equals true here. But let's, for argument's sake, imagine that there was no grouping, uh, there was no pairing here, so it's paired equals false. And we're also assuming that equal variance is here. So I'm going to say var.equal equals true. So an equal variance, unpaired t-test, that's the normal student's t-test, and we're using a confidence level of 0.95, in other words, an alpha level of... 0.05 and look at this beautiful result that we get. It says two sample t-test, the data is systolic blood pressure by group, we see our t-statistic at 1.4, we see degrees of freedom 498, we see a p-value of 0.15, so it was not statistically significant. We can see the 95% confidence intervals around our t-statistic and we can see the two sample means 125 and 124 up thereabouts. So all the information you need and uh, really lovely when you start writing your, your journal articles for submission to a journal. Lovely stuff. Let's do a bit of linear regression. So with linear regression we build a linear model. Keyword uh, The function for that is LM. Linear model. LM. Very simple. I'm going to say SBP A uh, tilde age. So the first one, again I'm trying to predict the systolic blood pressure given the age. That is the linear model that I'm trying to build. Data equals data, but I'm putting all of this as a single argument inside of the summary argument. And the summary is going to give me a nice little report as well. And there we go. It says the formula is we're trying to predict systolic blood pressure given the age. We can see the residuals there in our prediction, the descriptive statistics of the residuals. We can see the coefficients there. And we can see right here at the bottom, our adjusted R squared is almost zero. And we could see that from the visual visualization. There was really no correlation between those two. So really age is not a predictor of systolic blood pressure. And our adjusted R squared is very low. We see our F statistic there. Remember, these things are all built on F statistics and uh, analysis of variance, really. And we see a, a, a p-value there of 0.12. So really not significant there at all. Very easy to build linear models. If you want to add a second one, it'll just be plus. And then, for instance, we had CRP. So you can just continue adding pluses there, and you'll build more independent variables into your linear model. Lastly, let's do a chi-squared test for analysis, a chi-squared test for independence. Now you can see something else here. You can see it's a level three heading here with a three pound or hashtag signs. And then we have dollar and dollar. That allows us to use something called tech or LaTeX. And that is a mathematical representation of characters. Very beautiful when you print this out in PDF or Word or even on the web. A backslash CHI means a chi character, the Greek symbol chi, lowercase. And then the caret symbol in two, that means put some, the next, what comes next, put that on superscript. So it's going to be chi squared written out very neatly. And tech or lot tech is a language on its own. It's easy to learn the basics and incorporate that, but that's not what this tutorial is about. So what we need is the contingency table. Remember the observed table. How did we do that? I'm just going to redo it here. Data, we pipe that to the group by and we group by group and we pipe all of that to account of the side effects. So let's get those. 
137, 114, 152, 197. Pay particular attention to the way this was done. 1, 1, 2, 2. You might sometimes see no, yes, yes, no. So when you do build your contingency table, make sure that you put the order of the values that that is always the same. So the way that I like to do it, I'm going to create two lists. The first one is my group 1, that was 137 and 114. And group 2 was 152, 97. And I'm going to say the number of rows is 2. There's going to be a group 1 row and a group 2 row. And then what I want to do is to create a matrix. So this is what we use, a matrix function. I'm going to pass some arguments. The first one is a list object, C. And I'm going to pass the first row is group 1, the second one group 2, and the number of rows in a row is my keyword argument, and I'm passing that in rows to it, and that was 2. And I'm saying by rows equals true. Now, you don't have to do all of this. This is just some fancy eye candy that I'm building here. Once that is done, I'm using the row names function. I'm passing an argument to it. And I'm actually making this out to be a computer variable. That's something very specific to R. And just go with the flow. I'm going to put a list object to that called group 1 and group 2. And then I'm going to use the call names function on my matrix that I've just created. And I'm going to put no yes to it. And then finally I'm going to call this matrix that I created. Now you don't have to do all of this. It just produces this nice little table so that when I do share this with my trainees who don't know a lot of statistics, it's just a nice visual representation of that. What we actually only need is those numbers 137, 114, 152, 97. That's actually all we needed. But you can always just refer to this code, create your nice little table as we can see there. We can all see what that contingency table is all about. And I can pass that whole thing with its names that I put in here, the row names, the column names. I can pass all of that to the chi squared.test function. I don't want any Yates correction, so I'm going to say as my second argument there, correct equals false. And let's run that. And where there we get a Pearson chi squared test. We see there one degree of freedom, and we see our chi squared value there of 2.1402 and the p-value of 0.143. So really the group and side effects, they were not dependent on each other. And that's it. I, I hope you, you like R and I hope you want to use R and I hope you have a, a good understanding now of what it was all about. So let's save this document. So very lastly, I want to show you how I created that final document that we uploaded to our pubs. And what we're going to do is you see a tiny little button here, knit. Let's click on knit and we're going to wait a few seconds and it's going to knit from the knitter package. It's going to knit all our code together as a beautiful HTML file. Remember we said TOC to true in the beginning. So we have our table of content of all the headers that we use, the two and the three little hashtags. Built that all together fast nicely. I can click any one of these, it can go down. There's the logo that we put in. You see the colors, our navy blue there for the title. That was in the YAML right at the top, remember? And then our second level headings, they were all colored this gold color. They're all there. And there's all our code and the beautiful execution of that. We see our plots there. Absolutely fantastic. And because I've published it before, It'll actually say republish here, but if this is the first time you haven't published it before, you can hit that publish, and that's going to allow you to open a free account on our pubs, and then open up a page where you can give a little description to this file and a name to this file, and you will have your own our pubs website. You can also open this in the browser right here, and that is why I like to not do this as a script, but I like to create these RMD files. You see there's a tiny little down arrow there next to knit and that's remember i said we can overwrite what it's exported to because here we can do knit to pdf and knit to word as well fantastic i hope you enjoyed this tutorial let me know in the comments down below if you want to see more about the specifics before i recorded this video i actually put some uh, plotly videos out there and one or two other uh, tutorials on our have a look at those those will all be in the same playlist and i hope uh, over time to have some time to make more tutorials on the use of R for your statistical analysis.
In this tutorial, I want to show you how to create bar charts in Plotly using the R programming language. So I've opened a new document here. So it is an R Studio file, new file, and it is R Markdown. So this is a Markdown document. I'm going to go through a few steps, and in case you're not that familiar with R, in case you've just started, perhaps you're using a different plotting uh, library, such as ggplot2, which is the de facto standard. I do, however, really prefer Plotly. I can use Plotly in other languages, such as uh, Julia and in Python. So let's go through a few things. That's our usual setup there. Uh, I always set the working directory to the current working directory, set the seed, I'm just using 1234, so that uh, the seed number generator just generates the same values for us, and the library that we are going to use is Plotly. So if you haven't installed Plotly, just use install.packages, and it is Plotly. It is on CRAN. So the introduction, what are bar charts? Now, bar charts visualize counts of unique data point values in the sample space of a categorical variable. So what are we talking about here? On the x-axis, you have to have categorical variable. And in a categorical variable, there are unique values. So if I were to think along the lines of medicine, I might have different diseases, diabetes, hypertension, etc. And we're going to count how many times those occur inside of a variable. So I might have a variable called disease, and I'm going to count the instances of each of these in that variable. The sample space is made up of a list of unique values, and every subject, every row in a spreadsheet, if you want to see it that way, will have a value, and we're just counting the occurrences of each of those. So let's create some simulated data. So I'm going to create a computer variable called cities. I'm going to use the sample uh, command here. There is my vector of strings that I'm passing, New York City, Boston, LA, and Seattle. I want 100 values of those, and I have to say replace equals true, so that if a name is drawn, it's thrown back in the hat for random pseudo random selection again. So let's run all of these. I'm going to run my setup here. There it goes. That works perfectly. Let's run here my cities computer variable that I've created. Now let's have a look using the table command of what was generated inside of cities. There you go. It created these and there were 24 in Boston, 26 in LA, 31 in New York City, and 19 in Seattle. So that's great. Now I want to plot this, but I've got to think about how to get this into Plotly to chart properly. So remember there's a as.numeric command. So I'm going to call that on the table of the cities. And what that's going to give me back is just the numeric values as a vector. The 24, the 26, the 31, and the 16. So let's go for that. And we see indeed I have my vector of 24, 26, 31, 19, all those values. But I would also like to print the names in my bar chart. So I actually want these names that were generated at the top. And for that, instead of using as numeric, I'm going to use the names command. So that's names of the table of the cities, as simple as that. So let's go. And there we have Boston, LA, New York City, and Seattle. So with that in mind, let's look at our first chart, a simple bar chart. So I'm going to call my first chart P1 within the reasons and confines of the naming conventions of computer variables in R. You can name it what you want. Plot underscore LY, so plotly, that is the command. It's going to take an X value, that's what goes on the x-axis, and there I really want the names, as we had here, Boston, LA, New York City, and Seattle. And then on the y-axis, I want the values. So the height of the plots must be these counts, how many times we had Boston, how many times we had LA, how many times we had New York City, and how many times we had Seattle. I'm just going to name it cities for now, strictly speaking, I don't have to do that here because I'm only plotting one thing on my plot, it's just these four bars. But later on, we're going to see we can add things on top of that, and then this name becomes quite important. So for now, I'm going to say name equals cities, and the type of the plot that I want is a bar. So this is one of the types of uh, graphs or plots that Plotly can do, and we use that name bar. And then we're just going to call P1. Let's see what happens. 
So there we have our first beautiful plot in Plotly. If you've never seen Plotly before and you're wondering why you stuck around until this time uh, in this tutorial, have a look at this. It is interactive. It's beautifully interactive. As I hover over these, you can see there's Boston and it comes up. It was 24. I hover there. It says LA 26. It says New York City 31 and it says Seattle 19. Beautiful. I can also have a look at these things. I can download this plot immediately as a PNG. So that'll just be a snapshot of this. It won't be interactive. I can zoom in. I can pan around. I can increase. I can uh, zoom out again. If I lose my place, I can just reset the axis. And I can also, with these two little things, say where the information appears. Now you can see in NYC appears at the bottom and 3.1 at the top. But if I click on this, that information is all together. And if I click on this, it opens it in the pl Plotly uh, website. Now Plotly is a website. You can store your plots there. You can create dashboards. You can even change the look and style of your plots right on their website. So massively, nicely interactive plots. They look beautiful. I really do love Plotly. So that's one thing. Let's add some titles and access names. And exactly the same thing. I'm going to call it P2 this time, but it's Plotly. And it's X is still the names. And as numeric for Y, the names of city and the type is bar. We have our percentage, greater than percentage pipeline that we do create here because after the plotly comes the layout. Now I can add some layout. So the layout will have a title. It will have an X axis and a Y axis as arguments. The title is just going to be a string number of offices in each city. For instance, the list, the X axis contains a list with these key value pairs. So title being cities and zero line being false. Now the zero line you see this black line at the bottom? That will be the Y axis is black zero line. And then you might also get one going up here for the X axis and the Y axis. So this bottom one will actually be the Y axis. The top one will be the X axis. You can set that to false if you don't like that big black line. So you can just say zero line equals false. And you see that I've done that for both of them. Uh, it's just my convention. I don't like that black line most of the time. The Y axis then having the title number. Let's run this and see what the difference is. There we go. We have a beautiful X axis and Y axis written there for these two. And we have the title there at the top. So let's create some simulated data for a data frame because these are easy enough to do. I just generated some values, but most often you will import a CSV file or you will create a data frame. So let's do that. I'm going to create a data frame and it's going to have a variable called cities, which comes from the cities that I created up top. It's going to have a group column, which samples from A and B over 100 samples with replacement equals true. And let's have a look at the first six rows there. So we're going to have the cities and we see that's a factor and the group is a factor that was done automatically for me here. LA, 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 Seattle, LA, New York City, B, A, A, A. And that is the first six rows. Now I'm going to create two new data frames because what might I want to do here? I might want to group these up by group A and group B. And these might be two companies, two different groups in an organization. Think about it this way though. This is how you would get your CSV file, your spreadsheet file, or your data. It will just be in columns of these two columns and these more, more but uh, rows of data. And somehow I have to change this into something that I can put in a bar chart. So I've decided to start the series with bar charts because that is slightly more difficult to do than the others. You've got to think about how to convert this spreadsheet style look of this data frame into something that you can plot. So the one way that uh, I'm going to show you here is just one way. This is R. There are many ways to go about things, more efficient ways. But I thought of doing it this way, just, just to uh, reiterate what is available in R and just go through a few concepts in R. So groups, I'm going to create two sub data frames. One is called group A and the other one group B. And I'm just going to use the filter function, the filter function. And I'm going to group, I'm going to group everyone together that has a unique value of A in the group column and then B. So there we go. We're using the filter function there or the filter verb, I should say, from DeepLayer. 
that was automatically done for us with, uh, as far as the uh, Plotly was concerned. So let's have a look at the table of Group A's cities. If I were to do that, I get the similar sort of thing that I did before using this table command. So again, I can see Boston, LA, New York City, and Seattle, and how many were there were, but now it's only for Group A. I'm calling it on Group A. And again, if I only want the names, they'll be the names. And if I only want the values, I use as numeric. So I'm going to create a bar chart, a bar chart data frame. And I'm going to call it G bar chart, G for grouped bar chart, a data frame. The cities are going to have the names. Now, because both of the names are the same for both of these, that works out well for me because they're both going to be for MB, Boston, LA, New York City, and Seattle. And for group B, I'm going to have the numeric variables and group A for both I, A and B, the numeric variables for the respective group A and group B. Let's have a look at the head there. So there's just four, four values here because remember there are only four cities in this data set. And now the counts go inside of the groups. So you can see what I've done here. It is a sort of a pivot chart that I've created here uh, by using code. So we've gone from this to this for each group because this is what I can feed in to or very easily feed into Plotly. So let's go and see how we how we can do this. So I'm going to call it P3, my third plot, Plotly, and the data I pass first now. So it can take a data frame as an argument. So I'm passing a G bar chart, the X, now we use this tilde symbol to say that it is one of the columns or variables in this data frame. So cities on the X axis, it's going to take those four. The Y axis is going to be these values for group A, the type is bar, and now importantly, the name comes in group A. I'm going to create a pipeline because I'm going to add a second trace. Remember, I said you can plot more than one things on the same plot. And you do that by this add underscore trace command. So the Y is now going to be this group B, the group B values. And we continue this pipeline because we add some layout on the Y axis. We're going to have a list with a title called cities. And more importantly, we have bar mode. And this is the one that's important here. We say group. So it's going to create a grouped bar chart for us. Let's have a look at that. There we go. Now we can see group A and group B. If I would only written G there with uppercase, let's fix that. I don't like that. Let's do that. There we go. And we rerun this. And we have an uppercase G there. There we go. So it's a group bar chart. So it's going to do group A and B for Boston together, for LA, for New York City and for Seattle. And that is why we had to go this long route of creating this pivoted chart actually to generate this. Again, fantastic. If I were to click on that, group A disappears, group B disappears. I can look, just look at group A. I can just look at group B and that really makes Plotly fantastic. Stack bar chart is going to be exactly the same. Everything is generated the same except the bar mode is now different and it's stack. So let's have a look at that. And there we go, they are stacked. Everything else exactly the same. Now these were the default colors. It starts with uh, this blue and then goes on to orange, etc. Let's change these colors. So we have our original plot here actually. So X is just going to be the names of the table of cities and as numeric table of cities. That was the original plot we did. Call it name cities, type is bar. And now we bring in this new argument called marker. We take a list of key value pairs, the color being this RGB value, that's an orange, and I'm using RGBA. The A is for opacity, the alpha value, and it's 0.7, 70% opacity. And I'm gonna put a line around the color, and that is more of this black color, but only at 50% opacity. And I'm stating a line width as well, being 1.5. It's in part, still part of this pipeline, so the layout goes with all the things that we've seen before. So let's have a look at that. There we go. We have this see-through orange color here and this sort of 50% opacity black, which actually makes it a little bit of a gray, but it is there is some opacity to it. 
this color around. So let's change the text angle of the x-axis. We've all seen that where these are too long and they actually start overlapping each other. One quick and easy way to get rid of that is just to change the tick angle. And that's the only thing I've brought in here. That is one of the other key value pairs inside of the x-axis uh, list that we create here. The x-axis being one of the arguments of layout. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same. Let's go for that. And there we go. We see this negative 20 degree angle here in case those become too long. Now let's specify the color of each bar. In order to do this, you must know how many bars there are beforehand. So you've got to write a few uh, lines of code, specifically this names or as numeric, just to see how many bars there are so that you know if you want to color each of them separately. And that is again under the marker, the list that is passed to the marker argument. And it's color that we pass this time. And this is this vector of RGBA colors here with opacities. And we see it's going to be this 70% opacified grays, grays, and then we're going to have this reddish color also with a bit of opacity and then gray again. So it goes in order of how they are done. The rest is exactly the same. So let's have a look at this. And now we will have New York City stand out there in red. So in short, that's your introduction to Plotly. I think these plots are absolutely fantastic. They really are beautifully interactive and there's so much more you can do. In this video, I want to talk to you about the creation of scatter plots using Plotly inside of R. So I'm going to use R Studio for this. You can see that I've already opened a new R Markdown file. And to save some time so you don't have to go through the pain of watching me type, I've already typed in everything so we can just run. We can see the YAML up the top here. The title is going to be scatter plots using Plotly for R. Uh, created by me and it's going to be exported as an HTML document in the end. Our first code chunk here, which is just the standard setup, except for a few things. I've already saved this file to a folder on my computer and I'm just going to set the working directory to the get working directory here. So it's going to find out what directory this folder is in and it's going to set that as the working directory. We're going to import two libraries, Plotly and DeepLyer. So we can just run that code cell and that should execute no problem. Then I'm also going to introduce a bit of CSS, a cascading style sheet. So I want my headers, H1, H2, and H3, to be colored in a certain way. So I'm going to say style, that's the open and close HTML containers there, style and close style. And in the opening one, I'm going to say type equals text for slash CSS, cascading style sheets. And all I'm going to do Let's just use this hexadecimal values to just refer to the color of each of the headings. That's all we're going to do. And I also want a nice little logo, my research group's logo to appear. So it's going to start with a bang there or exclamation mark and open and close square brackets because I don't want any text there. I just want the image. And that is the logo image there. And it lives, this PNG file lives in the same directory or folder as this R Markdown file. And that's why I could say get the working directory of this file and then set the working directory. So I don't have to refer to the address on my computer's hard drive uh, where this file is located. I can just use it as such. Two hashtags, that means we're going to have heading two and I'm going to call it introduction. Just the introduction, you can read up about that. Heading two is going to be creating simulated data. So what we're going to do here is to set the seed one, two, three, so that all these random numbers, pseudo random numbers that are going to be generated will be the same every time you run them. And I'm going to create a couple of computer variables. I've got age here, WCC, so for instance for white cell count, CRP, C-reactive protein, SBP, systolic blood pressure, and group. So my age is going to be from a random uniform distribution. I want 200, minimum age 15, max maximum age 85. For white cell count, I actually want to round this to a single digit. So I'm using round. And then the second argument is digit. The first argument is what I want. I want 200 values from a normal distribution with a mean of 15 and a standard deviation of 4. 
we're going to make the CRP run off of the white cell count. So there's a bit of a correlation there. So I'm just saying take white cell count and add <coughs> to that. Remember, there'll be 200 values in that white cell count variable. And I'm going to add 200 values to that. Uh, it's from uniform, min, min, minus 2, max 10. And I divide that by 10. So I could have just put here 0 0.2 and 1. That would be exactly the same. So I'm adding these that there's some correlation. SBP is just around random uniform, no digits between 70 and 180. And then I'm just going to sample with replacement from these two string vectors here, or the string vector here with the two elements, treatment group and control group. I want 200 of those replacements true. And then I'm going to create a data frame with these columns, age, white cell count, CRP, SBP, and group. And they're going to hold the values that are inside of these computer variables. Let's run that and look at the first six rows. Very beautiful there, age, should have rounded that, shouldn't I? White cell count, CRP, SBP, and group. So let's create a scatter plot. In the introduction there, what I was going to say is a scatter plot takes an x-axis and a y-axis. Those are two variables. And for each individual, each row, it'll take two values, create a little pair, and we plot that on an x-y-axis. As simple as that. So I'm going to create my first plot. I'm going to call it P1. You can call it what you want within the limits of what you can name computer variables plot underscore ly, that's from Plotly. I'm going to use the format of passing a data frame to Plotly. So I'm going to say data equals df. And then I've got to use these little tildes to refer to each of the columns. So my x is going to be the white cell count, the y is going to be crp, the type I want is scatter, the mode I want is markers. So with a scatter plot, you can actually do lines as well. So you can go from, from point to point, just the lines, you can actually leave the these the, the markers away and just have lines so mode you can say markers markers plus lines you could write only lines but here we just want markers we just want the dots and something specific about the marker i want to pass it a list but only one argument in the list and that size being 12. so it's just a fair size for these dots in my scatter plot to be and then we can to pipe this so percent greater than percent I want to add a layout. My layout is going to have three arguments, title, axis, uh, x-axis, and y-axis. X-axis is going to be a uh, correlation between white cell count and CRP. And on my x-axis, I want to pass more than one argument, so I'm going to hide that inside of a list. So the title equals white cell count and zero line equals false. That is the actual black line that is drawn on the x-axis and y-axis. I just want them not to be shown. So then just, just going to call P1. Let's have a look at that. And there we go. I've created the C-reactive protein to be correlated to white cell count. We did that. We created uh, 200 more values up here. And we just add them, added them element-wise so that there's this bit of correlation. And look at that. I have a lovely plot. As per usual, I can zoom in, pan around, go home. I can save it as a PNG right here. I can open it up and plotly. When I hover over each of these, this one, for instance, would have a... Uh, 20.8 white cell count and a CRP of 2.8. When I hover over these, I can actually see. So that is very good. Now we do have a group variable, so we might as well group by that. So let's have a look at that. Everything is the same. I'm going to call it P2 so that I have different plots saved separately. And the data is still the data frame, still white cell count and CRP, but now I want to color by group. And that has nothing to do with the physical color on the screen. It just says take whatever you find inside the group, see what the sample uh, the, the sample is all about, the sample space, so you, the unique values. And we know if we go back up, we say treatment group and we say control groups, so it's going to find two and it's going to color them differently. I'm actually going to specify the colors and I'm passing it this uh, string vector. So I'm going to say deep sky blue, which is one of the recognized colors, and orange. The type is again scatter. The mode is markers, and the marker has this list size of 12. The layout after the creating this pipeline is exactly the same. And let's have a look at what R did for us here with Plotly. A beautiful graph with the deep sky blue and the orange. And now we can see control group 1 and control group 2. And as per usual, I can just click on one of them to take them away. Click on the other one. Now they're both away. I only want to look at the treatment group. Take that away. I only want to look at the control group. I want to look at both of them. Is that not the most fantastic thing you've ever seen?
So let's add a third variable as a color scale. So we know that we had, we said color equals group here, plotly and R, clever enough to understand that that's a categorical variable, but now we're passing it a, a numerical variable, age, so it knows to create a color scale. So that's the only different we've uh, a difference we've introduced there. And let's have a look at this. A third variable. Now the dots are colored by the age, the younger patients being dark blue, and the older they get, the lighter color it gets. This might be very, very useful. We can even bring in a fourth one, or just stick with three and not use this color, but just use the size of the actual dots. So now we actually have four variables that we're going to add. Now, is that useful? Should you really do it? Is it easy just to look at it and figure out what's going on? Probably not. This is probably overdoing it, but I want to show you the power of using Plotly inside of R. So everything exactly the same. P4 this time, data is data frame, X is white cell count, Y is CRP, the color is age. Now the size of the dots I'm going to play around with. So I'm going to take the SBP, the systolic blood pressure, and I'm going to divide each element by 10, and I'm going to round it to zero digits. So you've got to know that you know, round about 10, this is 12, so you have to know in your mind what it's going to look like. So this is round about 10. Now some of the systolic blood pressures are quite high to the 180, so you don't want those huge dots. And that's why I divided by 10. It sort of makes sense in the scale of 10 being a fair size, between 10 and 20 really what you want for the size of the markers. And I'm going to round that after I've divided by 10. I just want to round to zero digits. Everything else being exactly the same. Let's have a look. And there you go, a beautiful plot. So now we have four variables in this one plot for every patient. So I hover over there. I see this patient at a white cell count of 23.8 and a CRP of 3.2. I can sort of see on the color scale how old they were. And then by the size of this dot, I kind of know their blood pressure was on the higher side because it's one of the larger dots. So quite a bit of information hidden there. And you can well imagine that if you have a real data set, not simulated as here, there might be a lot of information in there. You might learn something from this plot, but it's probably overdoing it a little bit. There you go, scatter plots using Plotly for R. In this tutorial, I want to show you how to do, oh, at least how to create histograms using Plotly for R. So we inside of R Studio here, I've created a new markdown file called histograms. It lives in a folder on my hard drive. So when we do the little setup here at the top, I am setting the working directory to get the working directory. It is where it, live, uh, where it stays on my hard drive. I'm also seeding the pseudorandom number generator. And we're going to use two libraries. One is Plotly, of course, and the other one, DeepLyr, D-P-L-Y-R. First thing here, you can see inside of a markdown file, I can create a little style sheet, a cascading style sheet, which just colors the headings for me. Heading one, heading two, and heading three, they all get a different color. The heading three, that color is actually exactly the same. Let's complete that by putting in the semicolons. And then I'm also just introducing a PNG file, so that's going to be a picture that lives on the top of this HTML file or PDF file or Word document, whatever the export is that you're going to use. So the introduction, what is a histogram all about? Well, it visualizes the spread of uh, the data point values for a continuous numerical variable. So what it does is it looks like, it looks at the minimum value and the maximum value for that random variable, and it divvies up that range into equal sizes, and then it just counts how many of the data point values are actually inside of each of these little sections called bins. Now you can also normalize it, so it doesn't just count, but it actually just gives you the frequency distribution, and we're gonna have a look at that. So let's create a simple histogram. So we're gonna create here a computer variable called WCC for white cell count, for instance, and it's going to be 200 data point values from a normal distribution with a mean of 15 and a standard deviation of four. So you can see what we've done here with these code chunks. You can actually name the code chunk there so that when you go to the bottom here and you look at your markdown file, 
on the left hand side you see the top level there we go and we can see the chunks here have actually it shows their names it just gives you an easy way to navigate or someone else who gets your file just to navigate to where they want to be so these black ones that would be the uh, headings that i use there with the two hashtag signs so that we're heading to you can see all of them they're neatly done and all the chunks so it's very easy to navigate uh, for someone else or yourself a bit later to navigate this document so we're creating the uh, the so we are creating the uh, random variable here let's go and it runs and we see the median there is 15 mean 15.3 maximum 27 minimum 6 and let's create our first histogram so i'm going to call it p1 a computer variable p1 it's plot underscore ly and i'm passing it an x variable remember it's just on the x-axis is a numerical variable that's going to be divvied up and you have to use the tilde sign in front of your computer variable there so it's the tilde sign white cell count and most importantly i'm going to say type equals histogram to create this histogram let's run this and see what it looks like so there we go we've got an interactive histogram if i hover over it as per usual with the plotly you can see what is going on how many there are in the right hand side of each of these bin counts so it's a little bland and bare so let's add a title we're going to use the layout command uh, in this pipeline sort of notation so i'm adding titles here x is still white cell count type is histogram my pipe operator there or command there at least and then layout i'm going to give it a title an x-axis and a y-axis the title again just as a string there and on the x-axis i can pass a list so that i have these key value pairs i have a key of title and a value of white cell count and a key of zero line and a value of false so the title is just going to set the x-axis title and the zero lines can remove this black lines the, these black lines that might appear on the x and y axis naming the uh, uh, y axis there as well so let's have a look and there we go we can see the beautiful titles now histogram of white cell count i can see count here on the y axis and white cell count on the x axis so count i've specifically put that title there for the y axis because it's counting how many fall inside of this bin so there's five there's six there's five there's 16 there's 26 in that bin so let's just normalize that and remember the normalization is just going to divide the count in that bin divided by the total number which in our case is 200 and give you a and it gives you a frequency distribution and we're going to achieve that by just adding the hist norm argument here to the plotly function that we have here so hist norm equals probability uh, in quotation marks there that's all we've added and now I've also changed the y-axis title there to frequency just to so we're sure that is now a frequency this so this becomes this histogram becomes a frequency distribution so you can see what fraction of values lie inside of each of these bins now to do a horizontal histogram that's quite easy all we're going to do is we're just going to flip things around instead of saying x equals we say y equals so as y equals the white cell count and remember that you just have to flip your axis names then as well in the layout because you are flipping this around let's run this code chunk and let's see what happens and there we go beautiful we have white cell count now on the y-axis and the frequency on the x-axis so a horizontal histogram lastly what do you do if you want to display more than one categorical group and that is really what the interactive widgets are all about we can put a lot of data inside of a, a graph and then we can interact with that graph so let's create uh, correct the spelling there creating data frames and i'm going to create a data frame called df it's going to have two columns two variables group and white cell count to the white cell count i'm just passing the 200 values that were in there but the group i'm taking a sample of selecting from a and b 200 and replacing is two is two so this is going to take a b a b etc b b b a whatever the uh, random value selects and then there are more than one ways to go about this but just to remind ourselves of dplyr i'm going to create group a and a group b these are two separate data frames i'm using the filter verb and i'm only selecting values that have a in the group column and b in the group column for df so i have two separate data frames now as i said there are more ways uh, of going about this but i think just a, a nice just a little reminder of how to use the filter verb inside of dplyr 
So let's do that. Now, if you overlay two histograms on top of each other, of course, the front one's going to hide what happens at, uh, behind. So we've got to introduce some opacity. So the way that we're going to do that is just saying plot underscore Lee. And first thing we do is just to pass an alpha value of 0.7. So that's 70% opacity. And then with this pipe uh, command, we're going to start adding things. So we add a histogram and that histogram has an X axis, which remember the tilde symbol here is group A dollar white cell count. So that's the white cell count only of our group A patients. And this time I'm going to give it a name group A. So when the legend appears on the right hand side, so we can see what colors, what, what represents what. Adding my pipe there and then adding another histogram. Again, the tilde sign, this time group B white cell count. And I'm naming it group B. And most importantly, under the layout, there's a new argument called bar mode. And this time we set it to overlay. Everything else being exactly the same. Let's have a quick look at what this last histogram is going to look like. Very nice. We can see the two values there. And I can hide both of them. This is interactive, as you can see. And uh, I can hide group B as well and then bring them back selectively, whichever one I want to see. I only want to have a look at group B or I might only want to have a look at group A or I might want to have a look at both. So there you go, a histogram. So let's have a quick look what, it's, what it looks like when we do knit this and publish it to our pubs. Here we go in our pubs and we can see the title there. And this is the image that was imported and you can see the little cascading style sheet giving us this dark uh, blue, this royal blue and this gold sort of color for H2. So just colorizes and just changes uh, the look of this HTML document a bit. And we can see how nicely these graphs are plotting inside of uh, a web, uh, uh, an HTML file. We can scroll down all the way to this one that's going to be interactive and we can see group A, group B and bring them back selectively as we wish. So still interactive as an HTML file. So there you go. I hope you uh, enjoyed this tutorial and I hope that you use Plotly to create some interactive widgets as plots using R. So this is the second video on histograms using Plotly and R. Now I've had a question or two just about controlling the color of our histogram. And so this is in actual fact then part two. So what we can see here is my rpubs repository, rpubs.com forward slash, that's J-U-A-N and then H copper. And you'll find all my documents here. Remember, they were created in RStudio, saved as RMD files, that's R Markdown. They were then knitted as HTML and uploaded. You can also download the actual files here on my GitHub repository. Remember, that's John Copper, that's without the H. And you'll see a lot of my repositories here. The Plotly for R is where you'll find this growing list of files. Download them so you can uh, play with them on your own system. If you don't know how to clone a GitHub repository, remember, you can always just download and uh, the zip file and then uh, unzip that and all these files will be there for you. So let's have a look at this HTML rendered file created in our studio. Let's just run through, uh, just quickly catch up again. Remember a simple histogram, all we did here was just to create a computer variable called WCC. It was from a normal distribution, 100 values with a mean of 15, a standard deviation of four, and we created this histogram. We called our first plot P1, plot underscore LY, that is the function for creating plots in Plotly. And I said X equals, and then always remember that little tilde symbol WCC, and then the type, a histogram. And very neatly, we'll see a histogram here. Remember, histograms are for numerical variables, and it's going to bin the numerical variables. So it's going to create uh, these little sections, it's going to create a bin. So if I Hover over this top one, you see there 12 to 13.999. So uh, the numerical variable, it counts how many values fell between 12 and 13.999. And then there, from 14 to 15.999, and it's just rounding that off. It just means 16 is not included. And there it goes from 16, so 16 is included in this bin, then up to 17.999. So it's very easy to understand the histogram and you can see that this was 100 values taken from a normal distribution. I showed you how to add uh, title axes uh, and uh, or a title and axis labels at least. 
And for that, we just have this percentage greater than and percentage symbol there. That just means we're piping uh, this first function into the second one. The second part is a layout. I've got three keyword arguments here, title, x-axis, and y-axis. For the x-axis, we just have a string histogram of white cell count that gives us this nice little title up here. And the x-axis, I want a couple of things to happen. Um, so I'm passing all those keyword arguments as a list. So the list has a title and a zero line. The zero line is just these black lines that are drawn, and sometimes they appear, sometimes they don't. I don't like them very much, so I always put that to false. But the title is white cell count on the x-axis and the y-axis, uh, or white cell count and, and count on the x-axis. I showed you how to normalize the histogram. We've just added a hist norm equals probability. So it's just going to take the number that was in there. So if we go up, remember here, there was 24 in there, and it divide, divides that 24 by how many there are in total. In total, there were 100 values. So that just gives us this 0.24. So 24% of the values fell there. Change the histogram into a horizontal histogram. Very easy. Instead of saying x equals, we just say y equals. And uh, everything else stays exactly the same. So to plot uh, two uh, histograms, in other words, we take a numerical variable and we divide it into two. In this instance, you can divide it more than two by some categorical variable. So we created um, a data frame, data.frame, and we have two columns in there. The first one's called group, the other one's white cell count. Inside of the white cell count, we just put the 100 values that we, that we had created. And in the group, we use the sample function, and it's going to choose between A and B. It's going to create 200 of those, and replacement equals true. So 200 values, not 100, I meant. And uh, so it's going to have A, B, A, B, B, A, B, et cetera. And we can group the, these 200 white cell count values those that belong to A and those that belong to B. And what we've done here is just to create two new data frames. One's called group A and the other one's called group B. And we're going to use the filter function, which is part of the deep layer library. So DF, we're piping that or passing that as first argument to the filter function. So we might as well have written filter. And then the first argument would have been DF, comma, and then a Boolean question group equals equals A. So that's only the values that return true. So the values that do contain A will make it into this group A data frame, similarly for group B. And then we have to plot them separately. So plotly, I've just put an alpha value there of 0 0.7. That's just a bit of transparency. It's not normally how we do transparency, but I've put it in there. And then I add separate histograms to this same plot. See the pipe there? I'm piping that, uh, this plotly into both of these histograms. So X uh, is the group A dollar sign, the white cell count, the white cell count. So I'm doing both of those separately, giving them names so that we have this legend on the side. Uh, otherwise, everything is exactly the same. Remember, this is plotly, so I can turn off group A, turn on group A, turn off group B, turn on group B. Very nice, here in plotly. So let's change the colors. The first way I'm going to show you is just to use the actual, actual names of, of colors. And there are a few colors that, that do have names, and you can use them directly. So for P6 here, we have plot underscore Lee. We're going to have x equals the white cell count. The type is a histogram. The hist normal is probability. And then the marker. Now, if you see the word marker, markers are the lines, the actual dots for scatter plots, these little rectangles. For a histogram, all of those, those are markers. And I want a few keyword arguments here, so I'm going to put them in a list for the markers. One is the color, and one is the line. The color, I just want it to be light gray. And then the border, because you see by default, there's no borders in a plotly histogram. But I can add borders, saying line equals, and I want two things with that line, so I'm going to put them in a list. So the color is going to be dark gray, and the width is going to be two. And then, again, I pipe that into a layout very nicely, and this is what we get. See the dark gray border, the light gray interior, and everything else uh, the same. It looks beautiful, actually. And uh, so just by adding some elements here, keyword arguments, to the marker argument, as simple as that. So what if we want two? Well, I mean, we can just do that individually. Remember, I've got group A white cell count and group B white cell count, each to the add histogram. 
Remember, you could also say add underscore trace, and then first argument, or you can put it anywhere because it's a keyword argument, you would say type equals histogram. So no problem there, add histogram, works perfectly. And now I can do that individually. So the first one is going to be a teal color with a dark gray border, width of two pixels. And the second one's going to be orange with a dark gray border, width of two. And that is what it looks like. And uh, remember <clears throat> that I can always turn these off. I can always turn group A off, so I can only see group B there, turn it back on, turn off group B so that I only see group A. Very beautiful. Another way to do it is just to use RGB, that's red, green, and blue, and RGBA, which adds the opacity for us so we can control that. So what I'm going to say is list color equals, and then instead of naming it, I'm using RGBA. That's going to take four values, the red value from 0 to 255, 0 being none of that color whatsoever, and 255 maximum brightness for that color. So 255 for the red, 165 for the green, 0 for the blue, and 1.0. So it's not going to be transparent at all. It's, it shows the full color there for us. And then the line, just RGB without the A. So I'm not putting any opacity in there. So 169, 169, 169. That's a, that's a grayish color. So for the one on top, the group B, I'm adding RGBA. And I'm putting that as a 0.7. And again, the line color, I don't care about uh, opacity there. So we just use RGB. And very nicely, there we get our plot. And once again, always I can turn off any of the two, or there's more than two, I can turn them off so that I can just concentrate on the one that is left. So very beautiful there. You can really control the colors of these histograms. I've shown you two ways. Uh, I plan to make a video where we really go in depth about uh, into all the ways that you can control colors inside of Plotly. And I hope you look forward to that one. So that's it for adding. Uh, color to your histograms. Uh, we'll speak again in the next video. So in this tutorial, we're going to look at the ubiquitous box and whisker plot. You'll see them in many journal articles, in many reports, and they really help us to demonstrate the spread of data for a numerical variable. And it does it so by the use of the quartile values. And they're also very useful to help us indicate possible statistical outliers. So I'm here in R Studio, And what I've decided to do in this little tutorial is just to show you the actual R Studio environment as opposed to the R Pubs document, which was already rendered as an HTML file. So remember, we'll have the YAML up there, the markup language that tells the page how to render and what should be in it. And we're going to render it to an HTML document. The table of contents will be set to true, and we're not going to put any numbers to the section. In the first code chunk here, I'm going to put the libraries that we're going to work with. We're going to work with the Tibble library. So if you haven't got that, go to Packages here and install that package by hitting Install and typing in Tibble. Same for DT, that's data table. And of course, we're all here because we love Plotly. Next up, I always just style my HTML file with a bit of CSS code, cascading style sheet code there. And all I'm doing is the H1, the H2, and the H3 headings. Remember the H1 headings, that's the largest type that a web page will just uh, put on your screen as fast as the normal text is concerned. H2 will be slightly smaller, H3 even smaller, and it goes down to H6. And then, of course, just normal text. So I, I like to uh, put in some hexadecimal codes there for my colors, the three colors for the three text sizes. That's it. And then I also have my logo up there. This is how I put in the logo. I don't put any um, placeholder text there. So just open, close, square brackets. And then, uh, of course, uh, this PNG file is in the same folder as this notebook, so no problem there. So you can read up a little bit about the introduction. If you uh, view this uh, page uh, as a uh, rendered page on my uh, RPUBS uh, website, uh, or page there at least, and remember that this file will always be available on GitHub, on my GitHub repository as well, and the links to all of this, of course, down below. 
So read up there. What we're going to do here is just to generate some random values for three variables. And in case you've never done this, because I always just run through it very quickly, I've put uh, quite a few comments to the code here. So if you want to just read what every line of code does, it's all out there for you. What I like to do is just to use the set.seed function, and I just put a, an in, integer there, in this instance 1234. That just means if I run this code over and over again, I'm going to get the same random values back. So it all looks the same every time I run it. So first I'm going to create three uh, list objects. I'm going to call the computer variables income, stage, and country. Income is going to be from a random it's a random variable from a normal distribution. So we're going to use the rnorm function there. And we can see the rnorm function there takes three arguments, 500. I want 500 grand values from this normal distribution with a mean of 10,000 and a standard deviation of 100. But you can see I've wrapped this as a first argument uh, for the round function, comma. The second argument is digits equal two. Because income, it's, it's in cents, so I want two two uh, decimal places there for the values that I get. Stage is going to be a nominal categorical variable. And I'm going to use the sample function for that. And then I'm going to pass it the string vector as the sample space from which to draw these random samples. So the C function there. And I put the three values early, mid, and late in there. So that's my vector there. That's my vector there of strings. And then that's the first argument for sample. The second argument is how many I want. I want 500. And I always have to say replace equals true. Because if I draw one, say for instance I draw late, it's got to be chucked back in the bowl so that it's available to be redrawn at random. And we're going to do exactly the same for country. Again, it's a sample. We see the sample space there of my country variable. And again, 500 and replaces true. Now I'm going to create a tibble. Remember, a tibble is just a more modern form of a data frame. It's not going to create factors from my categorical variables. And it prints nicer to the screen if you render to HTML. So I just use tibble there. I'm going to create three columns, an income column, a stage column, and a country column. You see the uppercase letters there, just to distinguish them from these three list objects that I created. And I'm actually going to pass those values to these columns. Now remember these columns with uppercase, that's my variable name. And we're going to refer to them when we create our plots. And then I'm going to create, use the data table function. And that's from the DT package. And that just prints a very nice table when you render something as HTML. When you render it for the web, it really has a nice search bar. And you can go from ascending to descending order. And you can see all the different pages of data. So it's a very nice package just to render spreadsheet type data, a data frame or a tibble to the screen. So if we run all of that, there we go. What I should probably do is, there we go. On the right hand side there, we can see the viewer. And, and that's really what it's going to look like. It's a very nice this data table uh, when it is rendered to HTML. So let's create a simple box and whisker plot. So all we want to do is to look at this income variable, this 500 values, and create a simple box and whisker plot. And I'm going to store it as a computer variable p1, my first plot. The function is always plot underscore ly. And I'm just going to pass the arguments directly. Remember, I could have just um, added another trace, but we've just got one here. So let's pass all my arguments just to this function. First of all, type equals box. These are keyword arguments. In other words, they have names. So it doesn't really matter in what order you place them. So type equals box. So box plot. On the y-axis, I want income. Always remember the tilde. And I use the uppercase i, which means I'm referring to the tibble, the data frame. So I better tell it that the data is in this df data frame that I created. So if I used the lower case, it would have just referenced the list. And I don't have to say this comes from this data table or this tibble. And then I'm going to give it a name, all income. And I'm piping this to the layout function because I want a title. And I want something on the x-axis and y-axis. On the x-axis, I want more than one thing. So I'm going to pass those as a list. So the title is nothing. No title there. And the zero line is false. So on the zero line, I want, don't want that drawn to the screen. And you can see the y-axis is going to be income. 
and let's print it out and see what happens. It's going to print here in my viewer a lovely box and whisker plot. So let's have a look at that. We see the overall income. I put all income on the x-axis because it's just drawing it from this name that I gave it there. That's why I didn't put in a title. And then income here on the right hand side. And you can see it's been marked as 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, etc. So what is this box and whisker plot all about? In case you didn't know, the box in the center has these three lines. The lower line is the first quartile value. And you can see there Q1. And you can see it's at... Uh, the value there, 9,325.805, that is going to be our Q1 value. The second one here is the median, and you can see there the median or the second quartile value, and the upper edge of this bar, of this box, I should say, is the third quartile value. And then you can see these whiskers go up and whiskers go down, and what is happening here in Plotly is this upper limit and this lower limit will either be the minimum or maximum value if there are no outliers beyond that. But if there are outliers beyond that, this is going to be one and a half times the interquartile range. Now remember what the interquartile range is, that's the Q3 value minus this Q1 value. You multiply that by 1.5 and you add this to the Q3 level and you subtract that from the Q1 level. And then you place these. And anything beyond that we see as statistical outliers. And you can see they are nicely plotted there for us. If everything fell within those, then of course either of these whiskers would just be the maximum or the minimum. But there are outliers beyond both. So you can see this will be one and a half times the interquartile range above this and one and a half times the interquartile range below. And that's why you sometimes see these interquartile ranges, these, these whiskers, I should say, one longer than the other. Because you think, well, it's one time, it's some fixed distance away from the upper and lower quartile. Well, that just depends on whether this is minimum and maximum or showing the interquartile range itself. Now, many times we just want to plot this on its side, so a nice horizontal plot. And all we have to do, there's, there are more ways to do it, but the easiest way to do it is just to change it from the y-axis that we had there so income is on the y-axis, now we place income on the x-axis. That is it. That's all we're going to do. And then remember, we should just put this income on the x-axis now when we plot that text. And if we run this code, we see it's just nicely plotted on its side. So I've put income on the x-axis here as far as the title is concerned. But I just changed this to x, so the numerical variable is now actually on this, uh, drawn across the x-axis. So that's very simple. Now, sometimes we don't just want these outliers plotted. We want all of the data points plotted. Now, this is not going to look so nice because there are 500 of them. But the way we can do that is to say box points equals. Now, there's a couple of these arguments we can use. I'm just going to say all. I want all of them. But if they're all printed on the same line, you can imagine that you're not going to see all of them. Some will be plotted right on top of each other. So we add a little bit of jitter so that they plot next to each other. And we're only going to set that to 0.3. And then the point pos, point position, negative 2, that shifts it to the side of the box. Let me show you. Let me show you the outcome. There we go. We put this on the Y, so it's going to be to the left, negative 2 to the left. You see all of them there. There's a bit of jitter, so it prints left to right. And you can see all the values there, all 500 of them there. What if we want to add a mean and standard deviation? Because remember, these are just the quartiles that we have here. I can add this keyword argument box mean. And if I set it to SD, it'll actually do the mean and the standard deviation. If I just say box mean equals 2, it's just going to draw the mean in as well. But I always put it to SD, so then we have the mean and the standard deviation. And it's going to do these dotted lines for you. That's what it looks like. So you can see the mean and the median is very close to each other there. The dotted line is very close to the median line. And then this diamond, where it intersects with the whiskers, that's actually indicates to us the standard deviation. Great stuff. Now let's create more than one box plot, and seeing that we are dealing with a tibble or a data frame, we can just split it up by some categorical variables. So on the y-axis, I still want the income, so it's going to be this upright. 
but I'm using the color equals and that's got nothing to do with the actual color color like in red, pink, blue, orange, etc. It's the keyword argument for splitting the numerical variable up by the sample space unique data point values in this categorical variable stage. So let's have a look at that. So remember there were three, three uh, unique data point values in the stage, in the sample space of the stage variable. There was early, late, and mid. And now you can see the numerical variable is split up along those three that it found. So that will be income only for early, for data point values that are early in the stage, late, and then the mid there at the end. Now we can be even fancier than that. We can first split it up by the country. Now look at that. I say X equals country. Remember there were two. There was Canada and US. So it's going to split it up by that first and then by the color. So for each of the two countries, we're going to have all three stages. And what we have to do here is in the layout, add the box mode. And I'm going to say group them, please. Now you might get a warning, an error message saying that box mode is not a keyword argument in layout. Indeed it is, and it does work. So I've come here and I've disabled show warnings and show messages. And you can see it there, message equals false and warning equals false up there. And let's just print it out because indeed it does work, no problem there. So now we can see it's country, and then each of these are early, late, and mid. And always remember with Plotly, I can turn on and turn off some of the values that I do want or don't want. So let's turn that back on. Let's turn mid off. Now I only have early and late. It is really fantastic. I just love Plotly. Now let's just play around a bit. What I've got for you here is just to change the outlier marker shape. And if you go on the Plotly website, you'll see there are plenty of shapes you can give. So I'm going to say marker. I'm going to bring in the keyword argument marker. And as a list, I've got to pass everything as a list, even though I only have one. I've got symbol equals square dot. Square dot. Let me show you what a square dot looks like. So those outlines are just tiny little squares. Sometimes that looks a bit better because our box is a rectangle. Anyway, let's just change the colors a little bit. I'm going to stay with the square dots. I'm going to use the full color argument. I'm going to set that to a word, one of the uh, words that are allowed. And it's pink. And then the line, that's the out, this outlier line here, or not outlier, this outline, I should say. I'm going to make the color gray and I'm going to make the width two pixels. So let's have a look at that by just adding the full color and the line keyword arguments. And I see this nice pink and I see this, this gray outline that we have there. Of course, we can just choose. Let's just write choose correctly there. Choose. Of course, we can choose a color set, and there I'm going to use the colors keyword argument. So remember, there's color that is just going to split by the sample space of a categorical variable, but colors, that's the actual colors, and there are a couple of these uh, named sets. You can find them on the Plotly website. We're going to go for set three, and they definitely are set one, set two, and set three, and some others, and you can see this nice uh, pale green and this pale yellow and it's split it up by that. So really, box and whisker charts are ideal for your numerical variables and to sh at least to show the spread in the data and you can split that up by various categorical variables. So in this video, I want to talk to you about all the ways, or at least many of the ways, that you can change colors of your plots and graphs in Plotly. Now, we are here in our studio, and I'm going to show you the actual code as it's put together in an R Markdown file. Remember, this rendered file is available on R Pubs, and this actual RMD file will be available on GitHub as well. So you can see the markup language at the top here, just to instruct this coding to HTML what to do. We see a title there, author, and the output's going to be HTML, and the table of contents set to true. So let's have a look at the, the libraries that we're going to use. I'm going to use a tibble, as always. I prefer that over data frame. Just to print a data frame nicely to a web page, I'm going to use the DT library. Of course, Plotly, 
And then the R Color Brewer. Now, Color Brewer is a website that you can uh, visit, and then there is this wonderful package in R that can make use of those colors. As always, I do use some cascading style sheets just to color the heading one, heading two, and heading three levels. I have a logo that I always insert in these R Pubs documents, and you can see there how I uh, how I add that. Now, remember, I am using the set working directory, get working directory function I'm using up here and this RMD file and this PNG file live in exactly the same folder. So that by default then, as I mentioned, Plot has some excellent colors and you can uh, customize them extensively and then if we add our, our color brewer package, we can do even more. So first of all, let's create some data that we can work with. I'm going to just set the pseudo-random number generator. I'm going to seed that with an integer 1, 2, 3, just so that if we rerun this code, we get exactly the same random values back. I'm going to create a computer variable called cities, and that is going to have a sample space of these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 cities, and as I quip there, spot the odd one out. Anyway, I want 200 of those at random, and replacement is true, so that when one is drawn, it go, uh, that name gets goes uh, back into the hat to be able to redraw. So let's run all of our code. I'm going to run all the imports of my libraries there. And then if we go down, let's uh, create these random values. Off we go, and we see on the right-hand side under global environment, I see that I have 200 values in there. Now remember if we use the table function on the cities that is going to give me back at least to the screen this little table that just shows me the sample space values Boston, Cape Town, LA, Miami, New York City, Seattle and San Francisco and the number, the count of those unique values amongst these 200. If I just use the names function of on this table of cities, I'm just going to save as a string vector then the names, Boston, Cape Town, and let's store that in a computer variable called city.names, and you see I have my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cities there. And if I use the as.numeric function on this table of the cities, then I'm only going to save the numbers, the counts. So let's do that. And if I do have those, it makes, it makes it easier to create a bar chart. Now remember, bar chart just shows us these counts, so it's very good for a categorical variable. So let's create it there. And uh, we see plot underscore ly, and I'm going to add to that a trace, and this trace type is a bar. Remember, all of this could have just gone into that function right there. This is another way to do it. On the x-axis is the city.names, remember those are just the seven names, and the y-axis are those counts. I'm doing some layout by putting a title, x-axis and the y-axis. On the x-axis I want a list because I have both title and zero line, both those keyword arguments. And something else that you'll see here, I use fig.cap as part of my R notation up here, and that just creates a nice little caption for my figure if I render that out to HTML. So there we go, and we see the default deep sky blue color. It looks fantastic. I can hover over those and see the counts. We can see LA there at 34, San Francisco also at 34. So let's just change away from this deep sky blue default by using RGB and RGBA. Now RGB stands for red, green, and blue, and that is how your television works, how your computer screen works, those red, green, and blue little dots on your screen, and each of those can take up a value from zero, that's absolutely black, to 255, which is maximum intensity, so 256 levels there. And if we push the red all the way up to 255 and keep the others dark, those pixels, you're gonna see red. And then you get these mixtures in between. The A is for opacity. So I can also, if I use RGBA, add a fourth value, and that ranges from 0 to 1, and that has to do with a bit of transparency. So let's do that. It's exactly the same plot, but this time I'm going to use the marker keyword, and I'm going to pass a list to that, because I want to use the color 
and the line keyword arguments as part of this marker keyword argument. So the color, I'm just going to use RGB, that's 195, 195, 195. So that's sort of a light grayish color, all the values being the same. There's not going to be a color cast, no color dominates. So that's just going to be on the spectrum of pitch black to white and gray levels in between. So this is going to be a lighter gray. The line as part of the marker tells plotly what you want the border of whatever you're trying to plot to be. So that color I'm going to use RGB 2020 20, 20. That's very low intensity. So that's going to appear very dark. And I want a pixel pixel width for this border of two. Everything else stays the same. Let's have a look at that. And now we can see our lighter gray and our very dark gray, almost black border to these. So very easy to change the colors. This might be more appropriate if you're going to submit it to a journal who wants monochrome images. So let's just add a bit of opacity to that. So on the color here, I'm going to use this 255 in the red channel, nothing in green and nothing in blue. But I used RGBA, so I can put this fourth value, 0.6, that's the opacity. Zero meaning that they uh, <clears throat> from 0 to 1, as I said, and that is from being fully transparent at 0 to fully opaque at 1. So let's do a 0 0.6 there, and you're going to see the red's going to be a bit see-through. And there we go. So you can see those lines come through uh, as far as the red is concerned. Now I can uh, individualize each of these bars, I can give them each a value. So my marker here again, I'm going to pass a list of values. The color is what I'm after in this instance, and I need to pass values for all seven of them. So you can see two of them are a bit different, and you've got to do it in the order that they did appear here, that vector of names that you created initially you have to follow that order. So let's have a look at this. And there you go. See, there's no border. The, the color was the only keyword argument. And here we can see the transparency at 0.7 for all of them, but you can see these two, the LA and the San Francisco, they were the highest, they had the highest count, so we colored them in red. So you can really just individualize those colors. Instead of using RGB and RGBA, we can actually use a list of named colors. And if you go to this website of uh, the World Wide Web Organization, you can see a list of the color names that you can use. And you can see we said here silver, silver, red, silver, 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 red. And then the opacity, remember this one didn't have any opacity when we uh, uh, write at the beginning up there. Now I'm going to add some opacity. And that opacity has to go on its own. And I'm just repeating 0.77 times. So I have this vector of 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, etc. So let's have a look at that. There we go. It looks exactly the same. Those values I used were for silver and red. And that's another way that we can do this by just using these, these names of the colors. Another way to go about it is just to use hex colors, hexadecimal color values also HSL, U, Saturation and Lightness, and HSV color sets that you can use. So here I'm using the hexadecimal color set, and you see the I pass it as this vector of these strings, and those are the values for red, green, and blue, C0, 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 and then FF00, that FF is maximum, that's uh, 2 to the power of 4 is 16, so that's the maximum value there. And if we print this out, Again, notice the opacity there, I'm just repeating 0.77 times. Again, exactly the same thing that we're going to get back. Now, we've also got some inbuilt um, color palettes that we can use. Uh, first of all, though, let's create a tibble, and it's just going to hold all of these values for us. So there's my DF, it's my computer variable. I pass a tibble, city, and sale. So city is going to hold all my cities the 200 that we created before. And then I'm just going to create another set of values, the length being the number of cities. So those are equal. I'm going to round it to one digit and a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. 
and then the data table function from the DT package and that's going to print it to the screen very nicely here. You can see you can run through all of those, you can even go for ascending and descending order, you can show how many entries you want to see at one time, very nice the DT package. So here we go, we're going to add this trace, the data is DF, on the Y axis we want sail in on color by city, remember that has nothing to do with color, if you wanted colors that would be with an S. So let's just have a look at this box plot, and that is just going to give us these cities, and then the sales on the Y axis as we asked, and that sale is now going to just be individualized for each of the cities. And that's the default we use there, but let's use one of the color sets. You see the color sets, for instance, they have set 1, set 2, set 3, pastel 1, 2, and paired, and dark to an accent. And um, so those are the qualitative, qualitative palettes. You get many sequential, that's uh, this light to dark palettes, and you even get these dark to light to dark palettes as well. And examples of those would be dark 2 and, and brbg. So let's just have a look at two of these. Here's the dark two. So let's have a look at that. And indeed, you'll see the very dark colors there. And we're plotting out exactly the same thing, by, but by a certain palette. And let's have a look at this brown, green, and beige kind of color. So you see it goes from dark to light to dark. So if you go to the Color Brewer website, you can certainly have a look and also look at things like color blindness, etc. Uh, a lot for you to read, and I've, I've put a little of that uh, from their web page, the our Color Brewer package at least, uh, in here for you. You can also go to colorbrewer2.org and you can read more about these. So let's use that. And one of the palettes is the paired palette. So the way that we're going to do that is say colors equals brewer.pal, pal for palette. The number that I want is the length of the names of the tables of the cities. Remember there were seven, so that's going to give me seven colors back, just using the length. If I knew it was seven, I could just have said brewer.pal and then seven. Comma, what I want is the paired palette. So let's have a look at what that looks like. And there you go, the paired palette. That looks rather nice. And let's use something else. Let's just have a look at this. Now the thing is, that many of these packages have between 8 and 12 possible colors, but you might have a need for more than just those 12. And you can certainly do that with our Color Brewer package, and we're going to use the Color Ramp Palette function as a keyword argument. So this is how we would go about it. First of all, I'm just creating the sequence of values from negative 2 to 2 and steps of 0.1. And on the y-axis, I'm taking the sign of each of these values. So I'm going to create the scatter plot. X is going to have my X values, that sequence. Y is going to have the sign values. Mode is markers. So it's a scatter plot. And the marker is a list size equals 10. And the color then is this color ramp palette. Inside of that we have brewer.pal. And we're asking for 10 there. Spectral is what we want. And we want 41 of these colors, please. 41 colors. So let's have a look at that and see how that comes out. Beautiful, there we see our sign curve and we can see all these colors from red to blue and the 41 shades that we can see there. Absolutely fantastic. So that's in short uh, uh, how to manage colors inside of Plot there. There's really the uh, sky's the limit. You needn't stick, stick to deep sky blue. You can choose whatever you like and there are many ways to go about this. And I've navigated to this page where you can actually see uh, all of the open data that is available or made available by the World Bank. Let's increase the size. There you go, all indicators. You can see the indicators on agriculture and rural development. You scroll down aid effectiveness, climate change, economy and growth, and all of these, you can click on any of them and it'll open up a page like this. You can download some of the data as a CSV file. You can inspect some of the data. And all these indicators have a, a 
a unique name and you see that in the URL up here. It's a bit difficult to see. So it says se.sec.nenr. And all of these indicators will have their own little abbreviation like that. And uh, you can ask for some more detail about that. When you click on details, it will show you where that data comes from. So for most countries in the world and for many decades, this data exists and you can just go out there and grab it for yourself. Fortunately, there's a package a library in R that makes it very easy for us to use this data. So in this tutorial, I really want to look then at maternal mortality ratios using this World Bank open data. So I'm going to use an R markdown file, as you can see here. And my title there, author, the output is an HTML document with a table of contents being set to true and the number of sections being set to false. So that's my YAML up there. And then I have saved everything that I'm going to use in the same directory as this notebook directory. And I'm setting the working directory to, to get the working directory that this notebook is in. So the library that we're going to use is WDI, this World Bank Data API library um, that you can download. I'm also going to use Plotly just to create a, a graph or two, and then DeepLayer just to extract some of the data out of the data frame that we are going to create. As always, I use a bit of cascading style sheets just to change up the look of my file, my markdown file. And you can see I'm just coloring heading one, two, and three. So if I create headings one, two, and three using markdown, it's a royal blue and a golden color. I also have this PNG file, which is my logo inside again of the same folder as this notebook. So I can just easily ask for it to be printed in the final HTML file. So as, as I've mentioned, you can read up on that. I'll put the links to where this page is. You can have a look here. It really is all this data that really is available. Now, if we scroll down, I've created a second heading two year looking uh, up an indicator. We can look it up by country or by the name of the variable and the country codes. There are different country codes, the ISO 2C, that is where there are just two uh, letters to indicate the country. And we can also search for maternal mortality ratio in the name. So let's just do that. Let's run our first block of code here just so that everything is imported. There we go. Let's move down. And the first command we're looking at is WDI search. I'm using three of the arguments here, the first one being string. And that's just the string we want to pass what we want to search on. And I'm stating maternal mortality ratios. You can look through all those indicators and find it on the page there. Just use the find button on your on your browser just to find something that you're interested in. But you can also try it this way. The field that I'm interested in is name, and I'll show you all the fields uh, shortly. And um, short equals false, meaning I don't w just want a small bit of information. I want the whole lot of information from running the search. And you can see uh, what we get there. We get two indicators that would have uh, fulfill the search for us. One is sh.sda.mmrt.ne, and the other one does, does not have the NE in there. And there you see name. And these are the fields I'm referring to. So, so field was name, so there's the name. And then there's also a description field. You can see it there, a source data field and a source organization. So you can see all the fields that are available that you can put in here as name there. So I could put description or whatever I want to look in or even just indicator if I knew sort of what the indicator was. But I see one and two because there are two and it will refer to one and two uh, describing all of these for me. So let's search some data and I'm going to just dump it all into a data frame, just a good old fashioned R stats data frame, call it DF. And I'm going to use the WDI command or function here. And the arguments that I'm going to use is country, the indicator, the start time, the end time, and extra is false. There's a lot of variables that can be collect, uh, collected or, or returned from my search, but I only want the important ones. I'm putting extra is false. So the country, I'm just passing a vector of, of uh, strings here. So US for United States, BR for Brazil, and ZA for South Africa. 
So we're going to pass those for the three countries. Now I know those are the ISO 2C codes, but you can also look up those codes yourself. The indicator is the one that I looked up that was returned here. I'm using this indicator here. So that's maternal mortality ratios modeled estimate per 100,000 live births. And I want the start time to be 2005 and the end time to be 2015. You get data up to 2016, 2017, but not for all countries. So just to keep things safe, I'm only going to go to 2015 for all these three countries. And as I said, extra being false, it's not going to return all of the variables that is available, that are available, only uh, the important ones. So let's uh, run that. And we see we have our data frame up here now. There we go. We can also have a look at it, remember, just by creating a new tab for it. Let's close here. There we go. We can see that it's all there and we can filter using our studio. Let's get back to our markdown file though. We see this uh, table format, so it's nicely formatted for my screen. And uh, what we want to do now, uh, what I want, would like to do now is to show you if you asked for x equals true, what you would also get. So you would get the ISO 2C, also the ISO 3C, the country. The actual values will be hidden inside of this indicator here. Uh, here we get region, capital, longitude, latitude. So you can imagine if you use a package such as Leaflet that you can draw beautiful uh, plots with, with a map. Uh, so, so that could be done as well. So let's just filter some of the data. I'm going to create uh, three new data frames, Brazil, USA, and ZA, I'm going to call them. And I'm going to use this pipeline method from DeepLyer. So DF filter on the ISO 2C being Brazil, the ISO 2C being USA, the ISO 2C being ZA. So that's going to be this ISO 2C column. Here. I just wanted to group by, or not group by, I'm not using group by, I'm just filtering uh, so that I only have Brazil, only have US, and only have ZA in these three different, in these three different uh, computer variables that I've created here. And let's plot them using Plotly. Have a quick look. You can copy that, or oh, this file is on GitHub and it will be on our pubs. So I'm creating, creating three traces, and the traces will be those actual values for Brazil, USA, and ZA, and then the dates. I'm just saying DTS for dates, and that'll be Brazil that year. So that's going to give me all the years 2005 to 2015. So plotly, my df.plot, I'm going to call here because my df.plot that I created here is a data frame of DTS, trace 0, trace 1, and trace 2, all these traces that I've created up here. So on the x-axis is going to be my dates, on the y-axis will be trace 0, remember that's Brazil, so I'm putting in a name Brazil, the type is scatter, and the mode is line plus markers. I form a, a pipeline because I want to add a trace and that'll be trace one, remember, which was USA. So name is going to be USA, everything else being the same, add another trace and another one. And lastly, we're just going to look at the layout. The title is going to be mortality, maternal mortality per 100,000 births. On my X axis, I have year, my Y axis, I have count. And remember, I'm setting my zero line in this list for X axis and Y axis just so that I don't get those thick black lines in case it is drawn. So let's run that. And there we go. We have a beautiful plot, interactive plot with Plotly so that if I hover over, I can actually get the data. And you can see here how poorly South Africa has um, was around 2010 to 2011 and the changes that were instituted to, to correct this, but truly a horrible graph up there. So I've got some links down there for you for the WDI package and also if you want to learn more about what was wrong with the maternal mortality rates in South Africa in case you're interested in that. So that's it, a quick look at how to use Plotly and uh, the WDI package for R and go around, get your own data. I'm sure you're going to explore and, um, and uh, stumble upon some wonderful data and information.